Sir, we've arrived, the driver announced, bringing the car to a steady stop. He turned to relay the information. All right, Anders replied. A bodyguard opened the door from the outside and Anders exited the car first. Once Anders was out of the car, Jeremy leaned towards Olivia and whispered, So you're Monica Johnson now? How mischievous. Olivia caught Jeremy's words and raised the corner of her mouth, her face tinged with a hint of red. Jeremy's voice was magnetic, a pleasure to the ears. This soft whisper added an element of intimacy and languor. She'd never felt that way about him before, and it surprised her now. After exiting from the car, Olivia followed Jeremy into what turned out to be a full-service hair, nails, and waxing salon. Mr. Jarbaldi, this way, please. The receptionist approached eagerly. May I assist you with anything? Anders, in response to the receptionist's inquiry, offered a smile. Today, it's not me getting a haircut. It's this young fellow here, he said, glancing provocatively at Jeremy. Jeremy, you look a bit disheveled, and you could really use a tune-up if you're going to go around representing the Jarbaldi family here. Yes, please this way, the receptionist said with a polite smile, directing Jeremy. Jeremy hesitated before Olivia heard him think, I do need a haircut. Finally, he nodded. Wait for me, Jeremy cautioned Olivia with a vigilant glance at Anders, then looked at Olivia, signaling her to be wary of Anders. Yet when he saw Olivia don that mischievous grin once more, Jeremy felt he might have been overly concerned. Maybe he should be warning Anders to be cautious of Olivia. Jeremy was led into another room by the receptionist. Shortly after, another receptionist approached and guided Olivia and Anders to what Liv assumed was a waiting lounge. Upon entering, Olivia surveyed the room. It was a large VIP room for people to hang out in between salon services if stylist's previous appointments were running late. A coral red double sofa faced a crystal coffee table. An array of snacks and fruits adorned it. A gigantic flat-screen TV hung on the left wall, featuring the latest releases and ongoing classics. Not bad, Olivia nodded, casually selecting a grape from a fruit platter and popping it into her mouth. The sour sweetness was refreshing and quite delectable. Would you like something to drink? Anders slightly tapped the electronic menu with his fingertip. A cold water or a freshly squeezed fruit juice? Fruit juice is fine, Olivia replied, her gaze sweeping across the room and settling on the huge flat-screen TV. She chose a classic movie to play and then settled onto the sofa to watch. Anders studied Olivia's profile. He couldn't deny her striking beauty. After observing her, Anders made an internal comparison. Despite Miss Johnson's facade, there was an undeniable allure coupled with the influence she held. He was willing to step back and let her be his ally. He just had to win her over, so she would back him when it came time to decide between him and Jeremy to see who would eventually take over the Jarbaldi family business and fortune. Miss Johnson, I have to admit, you truly surprised me. Have you ordered the drinks? Olivia interjected, cutting off Anders. Er, Anders' confusion was abruptly halted, causing a slight discomfort in his expression. He nodded and replied, I've placed the order via text to the receptionist. Could you also add a serving of popcorn for me? Thank you, Olivia requested, turning her attention back to the screen. Popcorn is essential if I'm going to watch a movie. Anders' mouth twitched, watching an old movie, indulging in popcorn and musing about the essentials of film watching. Was she serious? Still, he went ahead and ordered the popcorn. Continuing to watch the movie, Olivia slyly observed Anders, who wore an unfriendly expression while placing his food order. Miss Johnson, is there anything else you'd like? Anders aimed to complete Olivia's order efficiently. He was resolved to win Olivia over. No, that's all, Olivia replied, her focus on the movie. All right, Anders acquiesced, directing his attention back to the screen. This is a Woody Bodrick film. Yes, Olivia agreed. She had a fondness for Woody Broderick. Anders remarked, 
I heard he committed suicide by jumping off a building. Olivia frowned, harboring a strong distaste for Anders' words. Why bring up something so somber? This movie isn't bad, Anders commented, looking at Olivia. Now he decided it was time to turn on the charm. Miss Johnson, I've always believed that love doesn't always follow a set course. It can strike unexpectedly. Fate is often kept curious. I used to doubt love at first sight, but you're not about to confess your sudden love for me, are you? Olivia turned to Anders, a warning in her tone. I hope not. We just met. Why would you say that? Anders gazed at Olivia with fervent eyes. How could he not feel this intense connection? Because I'm engaged. Olivia informed him matter-of-factly, casting a glance in his direction. I'm not... I... I... Anders began, only to be interrupted by Olivia. I only agree with half of what she said. Olivia declared, I think it's true. Love doesn't always follow a script. Anders' eyes sparkled. Did this mean he still had a chance? But I think a person must also demonstrate a sense of decorum, integrity, and humility. Olivia stated icily, locking eyes with Anders. If someone can't even muster those basic qualities, then don't bring up love with me. Especially not if you think that's some easy pickup line that would work with me. After Olivia's scathing reprimand, Anders' face contorted with displeasure. He couldn't fathom what he had said to offend her. Was Olivia perhaps deeply infatuated with Chris Jones? From the intel he gathered, he'd heard Chris had made many enemies and was also a typical profligate son. He seldom made appearances in Europe and showed no interest in his own family's affairs. He was nothing more than a never-do-well. Excuse me, your orders have arrived, the receptionist announced, diffusing the tension in the lounge. From then on, Olivia indulged in freshly popped popcorn while engrossed in the movie. Anders did not say a word. After the movie was finished, Olivia sighed. She was in the midst of deciding between watching The Sound of Music and Annie when Jeremy arrived in the VIP waiting lounge. When the receptionist swung the door open, Olivia was surprised at how attractive and dapper Jeremy looked. Wow! Olivia's eyes traveled from head to toe as she gave Jeremy a thumbs up. Looking sharp! She recalled that in their junior year at high school, Millie had praised Jeremy's good looks. Back then, Olivia hadn't paid much attention. Now, seeing Jeremy with neatly trimmed hair and donning a dark gray tailored suit, she couldn't help but be impressed. Jeremy offered a shy smile. Meanwhile, Anders, who had been nursing his resentment for over an hour, witnessed this and a trace of disdain flickered in his eyes. He still managed to say, You look so much better now that you're cleaned up. Always appearing untidy and disheveled, how could there be any? Let's go. Olivia cut off Anders and pulled Jeremy out of the VIP lounge. Anders, nursing his wounded pride, keenly sensed Olivia's animosity. He clenched his fist and followed her. Olivia bantered with Jeremy, paying Anders no mind. He felt stifled and resentful. He knew he was much more capable than Jeremy. Upon arriving at Jeremy's family compound in the Bay Area, Olivia scrutinized it closely. The palatial estate exuded a grandeur that surpassed Johnson's mansion. It was set on nearly a hundred acres of park-like grounds and had countless gardens that connected various buildings made of red bricks and white lines. A pair of stone lions guarded each of the gates that entered the property. Exiting the car, Olivia encountered a gravel path. After a brief walk, she came to a vast and picturesque courtyard. In the farthest reaches of the courtyard stood a row of dignified and solemn old houses, bearing the marks of time. Rows of various old buildings flanked the sides of these houses, while behind them were two standalone grand villas. Olivia felt like they were in the English countryside. She couldn't believe this all existed in San Francisco. Driving by the impossibly high walls of this compound, she had thought they were passing a small university or something. She hadn't realized until they turned into the gates that this is where Jeremy actually grew up. Yet as beautiful as the palatial estate was, Olivia felt a sudden unease upon stepping inside. It was as if someone was watching her, and the gaze felt distinctly unfriendly. They said ancient houses held their own mysteries. She couldn't determine if it was a figment of her imagination 
but Olivia began to feel a tinge of anxiety. Jeremy, go back and see your mother first. I'll find you later, Anders declared, his heart seething with anger. He needed an outlet for his frustration, or he might end up doing something rash that he could forget. Ignoring Anders' self-important statement, Jeremy's attention was solely on Olivia. Are you feeling all right? I'm fine, Olivia replied, though her expression betrayed her discomfort. This place truly unsettled her. Let's go, Jeremy urged, leading her around one of the older buildings to the right side of the villa. This is the estate's original house. We reside in the villa behind it. The original house is mainly for my grandpa and stuff. We really come here. Oh, Olivia nodded nonchalantly in reply. The steps are a bit high, be careful, Jeremy cautioned. All right, Olivia affirmed. Ever since leaving the old house, she felt a significant reduction in her discomfort. She turned around to take in the sight of the majestic ancestral mansion, though a trace of unease still lingered. Upon reaching the villa's front door, Jeremy punched in a password. The door swung open, revealing a small courtyard leading to the main house's entrance. Olivia spotted a grateful woman in a wheelchair beside a French window. She cradled a snow-white kitten, her long hair cascading over her shoulders. Her countenance exuded tranquility and gentleness as she gazed at the full moon outside, lost in thought, a hint of melancholy in her expression. So beautiful. Olivia couldn't help but marvel. Both the woman and the scene before her seemed almost otherworldly. Madam, at this moment, an elderly lady in the entire of a European housemaid emerged. She appeared to be around 60, her hair neatly coiffed and her frame slightly plump. She wore an old-fashioned apron. Are you thinking of your son and daughter again? Yes. The beautiful woman gently stroked the kitten in her arms. I wonder how they're doing in New York City. Quite well, Jeremy chimed in, approaching the woman. He grinned and said, Mom, I'm back. What? Jeremy? The beautiful woman turned to Jeremy, her eyes brimming with happy surprise. You're back? Why didn't you tell me in advance? I wanted to surprise you. Jeremy beamed, half crouching in front of the wheelchair. He pressed his forehead against hers. Were you surprised? Yes. The beautiful woman nodded extending her hand to caress Jeremy's cheek. Her eyes filled with tender affection. You've filled out a bit since the last time I saw you. It seems your sister has been nurturing you and taking good care of you. Jeremy hesitated for a moment, then stepped back a bit. Devin's extraordinarily bad cooking skills and her unwavering refusal to admit defeat weren't exactly what one would call nurturing. It was more accurate to say it was the servants that Albert had hired to cook. Nonetheless, it wasn't bad. Has your elder sister not returned? The beautiful woman inquired. No, she's still in New York City, Jeremy explained. I brought a friend with me instead. He waved Olivia over. Olivia, come here for a moment. Hi, Olivia replied, walking toward Jeremy and his mother. This beautiful woman was truly a sight to behold. Whether in appearance or in demeanor, she might not have been a world-class beauty but she was unforgettable. Come closer, the beautiful woman beckoned to Olivia. All right. Olivia took a few steps forward. A bit closer? The beautiful woman motioned. Uh, Olivia gauged the distance. Wasn't she already quite close? She hesitated, then took a bold step forward, mimicking Jeremy's actions, and half crouched in front of the wheelchair. The beautiful woman extended her hand and delicately cupped Olivia's cheek. You truly are a beauty. Olivia was momentarily taken aback, then smiled. Thank you for the compliment, Auntie. She knew she was considered attractive. But in the presence of someone as model gorgeous as Jeremy's mother, she felt rather ordinary. Madam, though your son is back, it's actually time for you to rest. The maid reminded. If there's anything you'd like to discuss, you can do so tomorrow, as per the doctor's orders. Mom, I can stay here for a few days. We'll chat tomorrow. You should rest for now, Jeremy assured, glancing at the maid. Sally, I apologize for the trouble. Sally nodded respectfully. That's quite all right. 
I just have to look after her health is all. You two enjoy your conversation. Jeremy, take good care of your friend. Jeremy's mother advised him before giving Olivia an apologetic smile. I'll talk to you more tomorrow, dear. She was then wheeled away by her housekeeper, Sally. Before Olivia could ask Jeremy anything, he beat her into it, inquiring, How did you feel seeing Anders today? Olivia rolled her eyes. He hit on me when we were alone. How are some guys so confident they think they can just make a move without even knowing anything about you? Anders, who was inching towards the door to the room, rose when he heard this. Shit, he thought, understanding now exactly how he had offended her. Realizing how he had provoked Olivia, Anders became even more convinced that she wouldn't be worthy of him or his attention if she didn't have a powerful backing. To him, she was just a silly little girl. She had offended Anders, the Jarbaldi's future heir, when she rejected him earlier. It struck him as the height of foolishness. Disgust filled his eyes as he watched Olivia's retreating figure. Sensing the disdainful gaze, Olivia turned around and locked eyes with Anders, catching the unhidden revulsion in his expression. I was just coming in to see that you've gotten settled, Anders stated, maintaining his composure as he moved to enter the room. Get out! Don't come in! Jeremy suddenly scowled and rebuked. Anders' raised foot froze midair. Upon hearing Jeremy's words, a flash of resentment crossed his face. He awkwardly set his foot back down in embarrassment. One day, Jeremy would have to follow Anders' orders. Yet for now, he still dared to address Anders this way. It was practically a death wish. Wasn't Jeremy aware that his foolish actions might bring harm to his ailing mother? What else do you need? Jeremy inquired, a slight furrow in his brow. Anders ground his teeth and declared, Great uncle and the others want to meet with you tomorrow, at ten in the morning. Be prepared. Understood, you may leave now. Jeremy responded curtly. Then you both should get some rest. Anders clenched his fist at his sides, forcing a strained smile. Rest well. With that, Anders turned and departed, his eyes seething with anger and a hint of murderous rage. Watching Anders leave, Olivia couldn't help but curl her lip in distaste. I hope that gave you a good laugh, Jeremy said, offering an apologetic smile to Olivia. It's fine. Olivia shook her head, indicating she wasn't bothered. I've encountered plenty of scumbags and scoundrels in my day. I'm nearly immune by now. <laughs> Jeremy chuckled. Looks like your immune system is quite robust. Haha. <laughs> Olivia joined in. I didn't expect you to have such a sense of humor about this. Considering, I mean, that guy's supposed to be your family, and he clearly has it out for you. She could read Anders' mind and saw he wanted to hurt Jeremy. At Olivia's words, Jeremy's smile momentarily froze before he gave a slight nod. You're surprised I can remain so cool-headed and funny under pressure? A bit, Olivia shrugged. She'd always pegged Jeremy as rather somber. Even Pamela had been spooked by Jeremy's piercing gaze and let out a shriek once when she bumped into him in the hall. You've met my mother. Jeremy raised the corner of his mouth. I imagine you've heard some things about my family. Some things, yes, Olivia affirmed, having indeed picked up a few tidbits from Sven. That so-called accident not only took away my father's life, but also took away my mother's leg. Jeremy looked at the moonlight outside the window. His eyes were filled with sadness and hatred. Because of the violent impact at that time, my mother's vision was seriously damaged. She could only see people and things within ten inches. Olivia was stunned. No wonder Jeremy's mother kept her close to him. Olivia really could not imagine how a person could suffer such a disaster. She didn't know what to say to console Jeremy. My dad and mom ran away to get married, Jeremy stated, gazing across the living room. There hung a painting, elevated high, depicting a contented couple on one side, each cradling a child. The girl appeared slightly older than the boy, mischief twinkling in her eyes as she reached out to hold his hand. The boy in the painting had bright, inquisitive eyes, 
curious about the unknown world around him. A smile adorned his face, clearly finding comfort in his father's embrace. The parents holding the two children wore expressions of warmth and affection. The man's gaze, confident and satisfied, met the artist's, radiating a rugged handsomeness. Beside him stood one of the world's few ancient beauties. Her hair cascaded gently over her shoulders, her lean towards the man revealing the deep affection she held for him. My dad was the chosen future patriarch of the Garibaldi family. My mom was his university classmate. She hailed from a literary family, though her background was quite ordinary. I see, Olivia agreed. Such unions were typically met with resistance. Even Michael and Victoria, though from the same eclon in society, had their fair share of hurdles. Fortunately, genuine love existed between them. After I was born, the family acknowledged my mother and brought my parents back to the compound de Ville, Jeremy said, a slight crease forming on his forehead. Had they chosen not to return, the outcome might have been better. The world often envied the opulence and nobility of wealthy families. Few truly comprehended the accompanying hardships and heartaches. The past is like a closed chapter, Olivia consoled, placing her hand on Jeremy's shoulder. Your task is to turn a new page, not to revisit the old ones. I suppose you're right, Jeremy affirmed. Can you guess why I asked you to come here with me? I'm about 90% sure. Olivia responded, tempering her enthusiasm. But as allies, it's only natural to make use of one another. I don't wish to exploit you, Jeremy corrected. The term use felt distasteful. Doesn't matter, Olivia grinned. Elegant phrasing or not, her point remained the same. For instance, her relationship with Chris was a contractual one. Ultimately, it was just a different kind of agreement, a different form of mutual support. I'll keep you safe, Jeremy vowed. Thank you, Olivia murmured, her smile faint. In San Francisco, Jeremy held sway. Her well-being here therefore depended on him. Will you accompany me tomorrow to the meeting with my family? Jeremy inquired. Yes, Olivia nodded. Her purpose in coming here was to glean more about the Jarbaldis in general. If she could join Jeremy for the meeting, she might gain some valuable insights. Olivia. Jeremy looked at her, his gaze a mix of emotions. Perhaps it was the late hour or the memories evoked, but he regarded Olivia with a conflicted, strained expression. Meeting his gaze, Olivia smiled. She could see a jumbled, complicated cloud of thoughts in Jeremy's head, and one of those was a memory. Jeremy was recalling his father. Olivia offered comfort. Don't dwell on it. What's before your eyes is what matters. Right now, the crucial thing was to safeguard Jeremy and his mother, who'd already lost a husband. You're right, Jeremy agreed. He should focus on what lay before him, on holding Olivia close. He bent down, pressing a gentle kiss to her forehead. Thank you. Olivia was taken aback. Was such gratitude necessary? Let's go. I'll escort you back to your room to rest. Jeremy released his hold a faint flush adorning his cheeks. All right. Olivia lowered her head slightly. Following Jeremy, her heart raced like a stampede of horses through the mud. Meanwhile, back in New York City, Chris Jones scanned an email as an unsettling feeling crept over him. He drew in a deep breath and poured a glass of water for himself. Chris, avoid the ice water. Having it at night isn't good for your health. Olga Jorgensen, reclining on the sofa, advised, propping her chin. Understood, Chris replied absently, the unease still lingering. At that moment, Sven's phone rang. After a brief conversation, Sven's expression grew graver. Hanging up, he turned to Chris. Chris, there might be a situation. What's going on? Chris's brow furrowed. Could something really have happened? In Europe? Italy? Who just called, Vera? Um, Sven hesitated, swallowing hard. Our personnel assigned to keep tabs on and protect your little lady reported that she's not at the Johnson's mansion or her mother's place. What? Chris was taken aback. Could something have befallen Olivia? Where is she? 
in San Francisco, Sven replied, concern etched on his face. They've checked. She's gone with Jeremy. Jeremy? Chris's eyes narrowed. What was Jeremy thinking? Didn't he realize how precarious Olivia's situation was? Was he actually trying to throw her to the pack of wolves? Chris, don't worry, I've already dispatched a team to San Francisco to protect her. Sven assured. Sven? Chris's gaze turned icy. Book me the next flight to San Francisco. You plan to go in person? Sven was taken aback. Of course, Chris would take matters into his own hands, especially when it concerned the young lady. Furthermore, this Darbaldi youngster was proving to be unscrupulous. Chris had saved him before, only for him to attempt to steal Olivia from under his nose. He knew very well that the young lady already had a fiancé, yet he was clearly meddling. I'll go get her myself, Chris asserted, his resolve unyielding. He was starting to see that maybe Olivia really didn't take him or their agreement seriously. In that case, he intended to confront her directly to see just how interested she was in being aligned with him. Understood, Sven nodded. Book a ticket for me too. Olga Jorgensen changed her position. I'm coming with you guys. You? Why? Sven frowned. Olga Jorgensen's position in the operation was already precarious enough. He wasn't even sure yet that he could trust her fully, even though she said she was on their side and he was related to her. Bringing her along might only complicate matters. Between the two of you, you'll need a woman there with you, trust me. I have a gentler touch. Olga Jorgensen smirked, self-assured. Even if I could, I wouldn't bring you. Sven shot her a look, treating her like a ticking time bomb. Her presence would only spell trouble. And you can't even afford your ticket out there on your own, can you? Fine. Olga Jorgensen huffed, puffing her cheeks. I won't go. Hurry up. Chris urged. He had no time for their squabbling. Arrange my flight. Okay, there's a meeting among the Jarbaldis tomorrow, Sven advised. I'll try to get you there in time. Your dad has your family's private jet right now, so taking a commercial flight in the morning might be the better option. Understood. Chris's eyes flashed with the hint of displeasure. He loathed flying commercially. All right, book the first flight out tomorrow morning. With that, Chris left the room. Even though he couldn't immediately head to San Francisco, Chris returned to his room alone and dialed Olivia's number. After a moment, she picked up. Hello, Olivia. Hello? Came Olivia's voice from the other end, a touch of nervousness detectable. Chris, are you not sleeping at this late hour? Where are you? Chris got straight to the point. I'm at Jeremy's house. Olivia admitted candidly. Chris took a deep breath. This girl was straightforward. Some of his initial resentment dissipated when he realized she wasn't trying to hide her whereabouts from him. Why didn't you tell me? Even if you didn't tell me, you should have told Sven. You left abruptly, so I couldn't arrange for anyone to watch over you. Olivia was slightly touched that Chris was so concerned about her well-being. She supposed he had always looked out for her. I thought you were busy now that you're studying at the university. Olivia admitted. She sat cross-legged by the floor-to-ceiling window of the guest room. Her gaze rested on the full moon outside. She had to admit the view here was stunning. When she remembered that Jeremy's mother couldn't enjoy this breathtaking scenery, Olivia couldn't help but feel a twinge of sadness. Chris's remaining frustration vanished without a trace upon hearing Olivia's words. His tone softened. In the future, no matter what you have to tell me, even if I'm busy, I'll make time to listen to you over the phone. All right, Olivia affirmed, resting her head against the cool glass. Remember that. Chris emphasized, I promise I'll always make time for you. Olivia caught his words and smiled. Thank you. You don't need to thank me, Chris insisted. It's what we agreed to. Yeah, well, still, I want to thank you for working so hard for my sake. Olivia replied, her smile apparent. Chris was rendered speechless for a moment. He forgot how much talking to Liv made his heart beat a little bit faster. Hello? Olivia didn't hear Chris and thought maybe something had happened. What's wrong? Did the call drop? No. Chris gazed at the night sky. Olivia, do you still think we're just two partners in a business arrangement? 
Olivia detected the gravity in Chris's voice and couldn't help but recall his confession weeks earlier. Could it be he really was serious about her? Her heart felt muddled, and she wanted to ask for more details. Um... It's late. Go to sleep. Chris abruptly ended the call. Olivia was startled upon hearing the busy signal on the other end. Was he angry? Or was it something else? Afraid of rejection? Or afraid of her actually admitting she felt something too? Because what then? She ruffled her hair and put her phone back on the lock screen. She hadn't inquired about the true meaning behind Chris's confession. Her thoughts swirled. Could there truly be love in a partnership that was originally built on mutual utility? Glancing out the window, Olivia felt a sense of bewilderment. In her previous life, she believed she loved Mark DeLillo deeply, enduring countless slights for him. She even went so far as to become pregnant before marriage in order to defy her family's arranged engagement. But in the end, she came to see the truth. She didn't love Mark DeLillo, but rather the idealized version of him she had conjured. But what about Chris? Was this love? Was this the real thing now? Olivia dared not dwell on it too much. She shook her head, offering a self-deprecating chuckle. In their relationship of mutual exploitation, love was absolutely out of the question. Theirs was a partnership of transactional benefits, supporting one another to achieve each of their lofty, ambitious goals in life. They'd face challenges together, side by side. But that's all it was, right? After her call with Chris ended, she found herself contemplating what he said. After a while, she shook it off and tried to explain it away. Maybe he only thought he was catching feelings because he probably saw that Olivia had formed an alliance with Jeremy and Steve. Maybe he was worried that she would be more biased than before to favor the seven major families, so he was trying to get close to her to prevent this. What a cunning scheme from a handsome man. Olivia chuckled lightly. Throughout history, manipulating someone with love and affection has always been a good strategy to get them to do what you want. This time, she nearly fell for it. But that didn't matter. Next time we meet, I'll just bring it up, she thought. Even if she allied herself with Jeremy and Steve, she wouldn't break her promise to work with Chris. She certainly didn't want to align herself with the seven great families. Look what they had done to the parks. And if she was being honest, she didn't even know what their purpose was or what this weird, enigmatic group of families really did anymore. The ideas of the secret societies of the rich and wealthy families with mysterious ties to one another still confused her. She had so much more to learn still about what was going on between them. But one thing was clear. Chris was worrying too much if he thought she would betray him. She'd always remember Chris's kindness and concern for her. She'd naturally repay those who had aided her. After stretching, drowsiness washed over her. Sliding into the warm, inviting blanket, Olivia gently closed her eyes. Then her mind jumped to Victoria. She remembered her mom had said she didn't want to remarry. How could Olivia not think about this? In this life, she too had no desire to wed. She had her own mission to accomplish. Victoria, however, was different. She clearly still had unfinished business with Michael. I truly hope mom and dad can remarry, Olivia murmured as she drifted off to sleep. The next morning, Olivia woke up and got ready anxious but curious to meet Jeremy's grandpa. Naturally, she opted to wear a more conservative outfit. She had to exude grace and gentleness. Olivia surveyed herself in front of the mirror, making sure she looked presentable. Satisfied, she slung her leather bag over her shoulder and left her room. As soon as she descended the stairs, the mouth-watering scent of food filled the air. She could also hear Jeremy and his mother laughing. His mother appeared to be in high spirits, a sweet smile lighting up her face. But when she looked at Jeremy, her eyes held a distant, unfocused gaze because of her poor eyesight. Witnessing this scene, Olivia felt a pang of sadness. She approached Jeremy's mother and said, Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Jeremy's mother heard the voice and turned in Olivia's direction. Did you sleep well last night? Very well. 
Olivia half squatted, bringing her face close to Jeremy's mother and flashing a broad smile. Seeing Olivia smile, Jeremy's mother mirrored it. There was a hint of surprise in her eyes. Oh, your smile's so beautiful. Well, Olivia smiled. It's nothing compared to yours. A touch of bashfulness crept into Jeremy's mother's face. She was already so advanced in age. Being praised by her son's girlfriend for her beauty made her feel shy. She figured it would be normal for her son to bring back a girlfriend or future daughter-in-law when he was old enough. Moreover, this girl had a pair of bright, clear eyes. With such a sweet smile, she was very content. Let's sit down and have breakfast, she suggested. Of course, Olivia agreed, and a maid pulled out the chair next to Jeremy. As soon as Olivia sat down, the servants began setting the table. Throughout breakfast, Olivia and Jeremy recounted their happy times at Marshall High, causing Celeste across the table to chuckle and shake her head. Celeste, it's time for your medication. The Garibaldi family housekeeper, Sally, whom Olivia had met the previous night, said. She brought warm water and medicine to Jeremy's mother on a serving tray. Dr. John mentioned he'll come to check on you the day after tomorrow to see that it's working. Okay, I got it. Celeste nodded and smiled. She put the warm water together and took the medicine. Mom, allow me to wheel you outside for a while. Jeremy stood and suggested. The sun is lovely out there and the chrysanthemum and red calamus are both in full bloom. All right, Celeste agreed. Jeremy proceeded to push the wheelchair outdoors. Olivia watched them lost in thought. What a contented family this might have been, if not for the so-called accident. I hope that you'll take good care of Jeremy, Sally said to Olivia, interrupting her days. Pardon? Olivia was taken aback. This didn't seem to be her responsibility. Jeremy has had a difficult life. Sally's voice, weathered with age, was tinged with melancholy. Olivia nodded, who wasn't acquainted with hardship. It was precisely because of this that she aimed to alter the destinies of those around her. Sally said nothing more before turning to attend to other matters. Weird, Olivia thought, before taking a few bites of her food and approaching the door. She observed Jeremy folding a flower and placing it before Celeste. Celeste seemed to offer some kind words. Following that, Jeremy set the flower gently on her palm in exchange for her tender smile. The corner of Olivia's mouth lifted involuntarily. She couldn't stand that these two could have been leading a blissful life right now. Yet tragedy had already struck. What they needed to focus on was vengeance. Unceasing, unyielding vengeance. As Olivia thought this, Jeremy returned to where she was standing and shot her a smile. Shall we go see the rest of my family now? Sure, Olivia said. She had no idea what to expect, and as she followed him from his mother's villa, through the estate's enchanting gardens towards the older houses on the compound, an inexplicable sense of foreboding began to coil itself around her heart. The path she followed wound its way through the meticulously tended foliage, and the distant chirping of birds. Once a cheerful chorus, now sounded like a distant cry of warning. As the gardens gave way to a series of ancient stone manors, Olivia's steps grew hesitant. The once inviting facades now appeared imposing and somber, their weathered stones seeming to absorb the fading light of day. Shadows clung to the edges, reluctant to release their hold. The narrowing passages between the houses seemed to close in on Olivia the walls rising like silent centennials, crowding her vision and pressing on her senses. It was as if the very earth conspired to confine her, to guide her towards an unknown fate. Finally, she reached the threshold of the first house. The air inside felt colder, carrying with it the unmistakable scent of age and secrets long buried. The entrance loomed like the mouth of a cavern, dark and inscrutable, inviting her into its depths. As Olivia stepped over the threshold, the atmosphere seemed to shift. The darkness enveloped her, wrapping around her like a suffocating cloak. The sense of claustrophobia intensified, and a chill ran down Olivia's spine. What unsettled her even more was the scrutinizing gazes of the Jarbaldi family elders that greeted her when she and Jeremy reached the home's formal dining room. 
After exchanging a few perfunctory greetings, the elders seemed to get right down to business. Jeremy, how long will you be staying this time? Asked one of the older Jarbaldis, who was seated at the head of the table. A few days. Jeremy's eyes were dark and impassive, as if he'd reverted to his old self at Marshall High. Olivia heard a woman's voice thinking, What a nuisance. The boy's father already died, and now he has the audacity to return, as if he's wanted here. Olivia overheard the thoughts, but couldn't discern who had thought them. She frowned and endured the discomfort of her mind-reading ability. Sometimes it hurt to hear what people thought of her friends. Using her ability to pick up on the thoughts of more than 10 people present, she was startled to discover that over half of them shared the same sentiment, including the high-ranking elders. Olivia finally understood what Sally meant. Jeremy was a young man, a pitiful person, but this pity only lasted until today. Since they were allies, Olivia vowed to naturally help her friend seek justice for himself as well. After a moment of silence, one elder asked, Then why did you come back this time? It's grandfather's birthday the day after tomorrow, Jeremy replied. He's already so sick, why would he celebrate his birthday? Olivia saw who was talking this time. It was a woman with an outstanding appearance. She was dressed in fine clothes and looked dignified. Unfortunately, the sharp, harsh look in her eyes gave Olivia pause. This year, we're not throwing a birthday party, the elder said. His health is not good enough, so it is not suitable for him to hold a grand ceremony right now. Well, the day after tomorrow is the anniversary of my father's death, Jeremy continued. I wanted to come back for this too. Jeremy knew that this trip might be very difficult, but he wanted only to protect his mother and be here for her during this trying time. Originally, my sister Devin also wanted to come back, but she had work back in New York. Well, neither of you really needed to come back, the older woman mumbled. It sounded like she was talking to herself, but it just happened to reach everyone's ears. Olivia looked around and saw displeasure on the faces of a few people sitting around the room. Some of their faces were neutral, but most of them seemed to be in agreement with the woman. Then you can leave at night, the day after tomorrow, the man sitting at the head of the table said. Recently, there have been a lot of things happening in San Francisco, so I don't have time to entertain you and your friend. He sounded a little snappy. It seemed like he was unhappy with Jeremy's rash decision to bring a friend back when the family was at its busiest. It's all right, Jeremy, Olivia said before she let out a laugh. Clearly, I'm an unwanted guest, so I'll get out of your hair and go home. Wouldn't want to put anyone out, she remarked scornfully. The elder in the center of the room's eye twitched with scorn when he heard Olivia speak. This little girl's a rude, ill-mannered little witch, he thought. I suppose it makes sense. She came with Jeremy, and birds of a feather flocked together. Cheese, Olivia thought when she read the man's thoughts. Apparently, I'm not the only one in a dysfunctional family. Before anyone else could say anything else, Olivia shot a cutting look around the room and told Jeremy's elders, And don't flatter yourselves. If it wasn't for Jeremy begging me to come and attend his grandpa's birthday party... I really wouldn't have wanted to come to this lousy place anyway, Olivia declared, arms crossed and chin lifted. Looks like I was right all along. And who do you think you are? A young man promptly retorted. Jeremy, you invited her here? Another said. Truly lacking in manners, an old man said. Jeremy, the highest ranking elder frowned, escort your friend out of here immediately. She's completely disrespecting us in our own house? How audacious! Someone jeered. Olivia's gaze swept over everyone's faces. What she saw was arrogance and ridicule. Her eyes were filled with disdain and disgust. She had come here thinking that she would be able to see a rich family with centuries of years of history, one of the oldest families in America. But they were far less interesting than she'd expected. They were just boring, wealthy, smug people who clearly thought very highly of themselves, and they dared to speak down to Jeremy. Jeremy, let's go. Olivia looked at Jeremy. She had to say that this time she was really disappointed. Okay, Jeremy replied. 
He knew that he would be treated like this. Everyone present was someone Anders had won over. With Anders as their leader and the potential favored successor to the Jarbaldi business empire, the individual now occupying Grandpa Jarbaldi's customary seat was merely a distant relative, entrusted by Anders to manage day-to-day -day affairs. With Grandpa Jarbaldi's absence due to his ailing health, this somewhat pompous granduncle sat there with an air of entitlement. It truly grated on Jeremy's nerves. As Jeremy and Olivia turned to leave, the air seemed to thicken with an unspoken tension. The once harmonious atmosphere now cracked with sharp edges of sarcasm. Jeremy's jaw tightened, and Olivia's eyes narrowed in response to the biting remarks that sliced through the air, leaving an uncomfortable residue. Individual voices within the chorus of disdain soon became indistinguishable, each carrying its own sting of malice. Jeremy's fingers tensed. Beside him, Olivia's stance remained firm, her gaze fixed resolutely forward, poised to weather the storm. One voice dripping with malevolence soared above the rest, its owner evidently relishing the discomfort she caused. Well, I'm glad he's leaving and taking that little slut with him, the older woman said. It was the last thing Olivia heard one of the elders mutter before Jeremy closed the door to the house behind them. When they were a few steps beyond the door, they turned a corner and ran into Anders. Huh? Are you guys done greeting our family already? Yep, there was nothing more to say. Jeremy glanced at Anders coldly. The people who were called over were all Anders' men. What else was there to talk about? But Anders already knew that, didn't he? Your family is very pretentious and self-important, huh? Olivia said with a cold snort. Where is that coming from? Anders was stunned for a moment and said with a smile, Is it because I arrived late? I apologize. He shot her a fake smile. Save it, Olivia said. Apparently, we're not good enough to apologize to, Olivia said, or to even be here. What did she mean? Did someone say something? Anders' expression changed. Then he smiled and said, Miss Johnson, there must be a misunderstanding. Misunderstanding? Olivia sneered and said, Is there a misunderstanding? She had just been treated like crap in front of an entire family she had never met. Where was the misunderstanding in that? After saying this, Olivia did not give Anders any more time to explain. She simply strode past Anders and continued on down the path towards Jeremy's mother's villa. Jeremy followed closely behind her. I can't imagine having to live on a compound with my whole family, she thought. Granted, it's a giant, gorgeous, multi-acre estate with servants and amenities, and it's all paid for by the grandpa, but still, these people are rotten. Behind Olivia, Anders gritted his teeth and walked into the house that Jeremy and Olivia had just exited from. Anders, you are here! The middle-aged woman, who had greatly angered Olivia, immediately stood up, her eyes sparkling. Mom, sit down. Anders glanced at her, then looked around and said in a cold voice, Jeremy came back this time, obviously, to seize power. Do you really think the person he brought back was just a normal guest? Did these people have no brains? As soon as Anders finished speaking, everyone sat stunned for a moment, and then curled their lips disapprovingly. What kind of important little teen girl does Jeremy know? One asked defiantly. Anders' mother smiled and said, Anders, you are worrying too much. If that girl really was important, how could we not know her? That's right. Let them get out of here. Anders clenched his fists. Anders, who is she? The elder, seated in the middle, frowned and asked, Someone capable of making Anders this worked up clearly had to be significant. Perhaps Jeremy really had found a powerful backer to help him mount a campaign to become successor to the Jarbaldi Empire. Great uncle. Anders' tone was respectful when he looked at the elder. She is Miss Olivia Johnson. Of the Johnson family? The Johnson family of the seven families? Everyone furrowed their brows. Although both families were supposedly allies, there was still a great distance away from one another. 
and hadn't really interacted in years, so they weren't aware of the younger generation of Johnsons, at least in such a way that they could pick them out of a lineup. Yes, and she's well-respected and connected not only to the Johnsons, but to the Parks and to the Jones. And she even has connections to Chef Theodore Jones, among others. Anders said. Her connections were the true source of his fear. Really? Everyone was stunned. They looked at each other in disbelief, worried they had just offended the wrong person. In the world of socialites and business tycoons, there was nothing worse than accidentally alienating the wrong person. Sitting on the leather sofa back in Jeremy's villa, Olivia plucked a grape from the fruit plate and tasted its sweet yet tangy flavor. Meanwhile, Jeremy rested his hand on his knee and remarked, I've given you quite the show as soon as I arrive. It's not bad, Olivia smiled. Honestly, more than anything, I'd say I'm a bit disappointed in the Jarbaldi family. The people you just saw aren't the true members of the Jarbaldi family, Jeremy assured her, his expression complicated. They're all Anders people, mostly the more ancillary relatives who've never worked and always lived off their trust funds. Anders has told them that if they support his bid for power, he'll make sure they'll always be taken care of. Jeremy had anticipated a genuine family gathering for his grandpa's birthday, including the members of his family who actually supported him as well, like his cousins and aunts and uncles who were busy working today, clearly. But apparently, Anders had other plans. I see, Olivia mused. And the one in the high position? Great uncle, Jeremy replied. He's my grandpa's younger brother. And who's that woman? Olivia pressed. The one who can't seem to stop talking. Who? Jeremy asked, not sure which woman she meant. The one with the pearls around her neck? Olivia recalled the woman's attire. Oh, that's Anders' mother, Jeremy said after a moment's thought. Anders' mother? Olivia's brow furrowed. She remembered that Sven had told her about Anders' Darbaldi, but that he mentioned Anders was a foster son who had been adopted by Jeremy's grandpa. Liv didn't realize his mother lived here too. What happened to his biological father then? She asked, curious. Nobody really says. The common theory is he's simply missing. Jeremy shook his head. His whereabouts are unknown, but even if he were around, Anders is so ruthless he probably wouldn't let his dad remain in the Jarbaldi family as an obstacle. He sneered. Olivia pursed her lips. You know... I can't help but think Anders isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. Like, is he really that cunning and capable of hurting you? Why do you let him keep you down? That's just part of his act, and on the surface, he can come off a bit socially dense. Jeremy recalled and explained, Anders is adept at business. The projects he invests in tend to thrive. A few years ago, Franco Alva continually undermined the Jarbaldis in a lot of our businesses. Our finances were stifled. We were on the brink of bankruptcy. Alva? Undermining the Jarbaldis? Olivia echoed Jeremy's words. Exactly, it wasn't unexpected. The seven great families and the Jones and Jorgensen families have always been at odds. Jeremy responded. But Franco Alva was unexpected. So when the Jarbaldis were struggling, the rest of the major families didn't band together against Franco? Olivia inquired. No, Jeremy shook his head. We initially thought it was just regular business competition in San Francisco, normal tech stuff and all that. It was only later that we discovered that Franco Alva was aggressively going after our companies and our stock prices and products. He was trying to take us down. So Anders was the one who turned the tide for Jarbaldi's during its most challenging period? Olivia sought clarification. Yes, Jeremy nodded. He implemented a bunch of new strategies, consolidated our branches, made sure things were streamlined so we got through it. During that time, Anders turned a few of our businesses around and gained the support of many people in our family. And did the rest of the Jarbaldi family simply stand by while you were being undermined? Olivia questioned. Considering the circumstances, not actively opposing him was a decent outcome financially. Jeremy mused with a self-deprecating smile. 
His mother had never been embraced by the Darbaldi family, let alone himself. It seems like you're facing enemies from all directions. Olivia sympathized, shaking her head. It was starting to make sense. Yes, Jeremy agreed. That's the reality of the situation. Hmm. Olivia pondered for a moment, her gaze fixed on Jeremy. Your current situation is truly something. I apologize for pulling you into this. Jeremy smiled apologetically. I'm fine. Olivia waved her hand. We're allies, and I know what we should do next. Next? Jeremy frowned slightly. He knew his great uncle wanted to chase them away immediately, but he didn't want to leave just yet. Yes, next. Olivia leaned against the sofa, her gaze fixed on the door. Next, let's see if Anders comes crawling back, apologizing for how your relatives just treated me and begging me for forgiveness. But... Jeremy's brow furrowed. Why would he do that? He'll apologize to me because he'll feel like he has to, Olivia said confidently. She didn't know if Anders was truly a business genius, but she was certain that he would do everything in his power to win her over. Becoming the patriarch of the Jarbaldi family wasn't just about personal capability and support within the family but also gaining the approval of all the core members of the family and beyond. Anders could see that the seven families were growing apart, and he felt that there was something unique about the young Johnson girl. Upon realizing she was indeed Olivia Johnson and not Monica, he saw that she was connected to a very powerful family, and to the Parks, and to the Jones family. On top of that, she was incredibly ambitious. If he could court her favor he would have a lot of power in his pocket. Olivia sneered inwardly. Her powerful influence wasn't something just anyone could latch onto. Jeremy watched Olivia's sly smile with a fond gaze. He liked Olivia, and he'd come to realize this long ago. He liked every facet of her. Her kindness, her assertiveness, her dominance, her allure. The closer he got to her, the more intriguing qualities he discovered in her. Jeremy had to admit that he was captivated by her, despite his ongoing resistance. Soon, a commotion outside grabbed both Jeremy and Olivia's attention, and they both looked out the window to find that Anders was leading a few of the elders towards Jeremy's villa. Some of them seemed to be holding tiny gifts, little trinkets from around their house, as little welcome gifts or tokens of appreciation. Anders stopped at the entrance to the villa when Jeremy shot him a stern look before he stepped inside. It was one thing to endure a bunch of nonsense at one of his relatives' houses, but it was quite another to let people ridicule or berate him in his own villa. Jeremy wouldn't tolerate anyone spouting nonsense or insulting his guests in here. He wouldn't put Olivia through that. Seeing that Anders stopped just short of the entryway, his little band of followers were also forced to stop outside and crane their necks to see Olivia inside. Have some tea, Jeremy suggested turning to pour a cup of tea for Olivia. Sally makes these tea bags by hand after picking herbs and spices from the garden and then drying them to make these. Olivia lifted the teacup to her lips and savored the delicate fragrance and smooth, mellow flavor. It left only a subtle floral aftertaste on her palate. Clearly, Sally had put great care into making it. Wow, this is so delicious. Jeremy's lips quirked into a small smile. I'm glad you like it. Seeing the two of them enjoying their tea and conversation, the elders who stood at the door couldn't linger any longer. They weren't just denied entry into the villa, they were entirely disregarded while these two carried on with their small talk. This brash kid had truly secured a powerful ally, and now his haughty, smug demeanor was utterly grating. Miss Johnson, Anders called out, masking the displeasure in his eyes. Yes? Olivia turned toward the door, feigning surprise. Anders, what brings you here? She surveyed the smiling onlookers. Olivia arched an eyebrow. Why so many sudden visitors? Are they here to chase me away? No, Anders protested. Miss Johnson, you misunderstand. Really? Olivia raised a skeptical brow. We, we brought gifts as a special gesture to apologize to you, didn't we? 
a young man beside Anders interjected. We were too rash in asking you to leave before, you have to understand. We've been very tight-knit and closed off and sad lately, given the poor health of our family's patriarch. So we may have overreacted when we thought our young Jeremy here was bringing guests to try to party at our house during such a serious time. We hope you don't hold it against us. Olivia chuckled lightly, a cunning glint in her eyes. She delicately placed her teacup on the table and shifted her position. She tilted her chin slightly, her gaze locked on the group at the door. Not hold it against you, she thought. Of course I'm going to hold it against you. Observing Olivia's silence, everyone began to feel a twinge of awkwardness. They had no inkling that Jeremy, that impudent, quiet, socially awkward kid, could secure such a formidable ally and friend. They had assumed he was merely bringing along a casual girlfriend. Miss Johnson, what occurred earlier was simply a misunderstanding. Anders offered with a smile. My family has indeed been preoccupied of late. Jeremy didn't even have a chance to offer his greetings to our elders before bringing your friend here to meet them. So it wouldn't be fair to hold that against them. Greetings? Jeremy scoffed. This is the first time I've heard that I'm expected to greet relatives first before I do anything when I come home to pay respects to my late father. You certainly are making up some fun new family traditions. Grandpa is gravely ill. Everyone has been engrossed in attending to him. It's understandable if they momentarily overlooked the formalities. Anders tried to explain, but Olivia cut him off. Well, I guess any excuse for poor manners is better than nothing. Olivia declared, shaking her head. Anders found himself at a loss for words. But it's not your fault, Olivia added coyly, placing her hands on her knees. Upon hearing this, the tension in the room eased considerably. As long as she understood they weren't at fault to begin with, things were fine. Olivia offered a scornful smile to Anders as she looked him dead in the eye and said, We can't expect certain outsiders who aren't even blood relatives, to have the same upbringing as the Tarbaldi family. At this point, the expressions of everyone in the room turned extremely grim. Anders' continent stiffened. This was a blatant affront to his dignity. If he didn't speak up now, how could he hope to win others' favor in the future? Miss Johnson, I may be adopted, but I assure you the Tarbaldi family is my family. And that haughty woman from earlier is also your family? Olivia leaned in, remarking. To be frank, everyone else was slightly more tolerable. But the elderly man occupying the center seat and the woman wearing that pearl necklace are genuinely exasperating. If you want my forgiveness, you'll have to have them personally apologize to me. The individual in the center seat is my great uncle. He's the younger brother of my grandpa, the Jarbaldi family patriarch, your request might be a bit excessive, isn't it? Anders' demeanor grew stern, his eyes seething with anger. Don't you have any respect for your elders? Listen, Olivia shrugged. Either the two of them apologize to me, or I'll simply never be able to let this go. Ever. Olivia slammed the table, projecting the haughtiness of a headstrong young woman. Simultaneously, with a mere thought, she gleaned everyone's sentiments confirming their intense aversion towards her. Olivia felt a sense of contentment. This was the desired effect. I can't do it. Anders clenched his teeth. Then don't blame me for leaving things on such bad terms, Olivia declared, raising her chin. A standoff ensued. Jeremy remained silent, engrossed in sipping his flower tea. His gaze never wavered from Olivia. He found himself drawn to the enigmatic allure of this spirited girl. Jeremy couldn't help but wonder, was he perhaps a masochist? Why did he let himself fall for someone who obviously was already in love with Chris? Just as Olivia was retrieving her phone, a woman's cough sounded from the periphery. Both Olivia and Jeremy turned to look, immediately rising to their feet. Mom, Jeremy said, surprised. Auntie, Anders muttered. Behave. Jeremy's mother spoke serenely, directing her gaze towards Olivia and Jeremy. Olivia? Celeste? Olivia walked over to Jeremy's mother and crouched down in front of her wheelchair. What's wrong? She asked softly. 
judging by the arrogant attitude displayed by those people earlier. Olivia could easily envision the kind of life this delicate beauty led when Jeremy and his sister weren't around. Olivia, my great uncle holds a position of authority in the family. He's physically frail, though, and should not be forced to come in here and apologize, even if I want him to apologize to you. Jeremy's mother gently caressed Olivia's cheek, offering an apologetic smile. It wouldn't be appropriate to summon him for an apology at his age, though. I hope you can grant me this favor. Olivia deliberated briefly before nodding. All right. Thank you. Jeremy's mother expressed her gratitude. She had dealt with all the annoying cousins and aunts and uncles of the Jarbaldi family countless times since her accident, so she knew they had likely employed the same tactics against Olivia as they had against her in the past. It clearly was tough on the young girl. She resolved to speak to Jeremy about this matter later. Olivia deserved better treatment. Girls ought to be spoiled and cherished, not treated like dirt by a man's family. All right, fine, if he's too frail to come in here and apologize then I won't demand he apologize, Olivia said with a serious smile. She then stood and turned her gaze to Anders. But that woman who insulted me back there must come apologize to me at least. It doesn't matter who conveys the message. Anders looked at Jeremy, who was calmly sipping tea, and then at Olivia. He could only nod resolutely. All right. He turned and instructed, fetch my mother. Observing Anders' conduct, Olivia's brow furrowed slightly. Something didn't add up. Without a word, Olivia wheeled Celeste over and positioned the wheelchair beside the sofa. Jeremy prepared a cup of tea and handed it to his mother. Mom, I have some tea. All right. Jeremy's mother nodded, taking a sip. This tea is wonderfully fragrant. After a brief wait, everyone watched as the woman whom Olivia had summoned for an apology was escorted over by a maid. The woman moved through the garden with an unsteady gait, her steps unsure and occasionally stumbling over the uneven stones. Her posture lacked the usual confidence, her shoulders slightly hunched and her chin neither high nor low, but rather in a state of uncertainty. As she advanced, her gaze darted erratically, flitting from one flower to another, not with appreciation but with a sort of restless impatience. Her fingers brushed clumsily against the leaves as if struggling to find a connection with the natural world around her. The maid tried to hurry her along, but she shirked her off and then turned with a stumble, her movements lacking the fluidity one might expect. She followed the maid, but it was more of a stumble and shuffle than a graceful procession. Before the woman entered Jeremy's villa, her disagreeable and grating voice reached their ears. This blasted path is such a headache to walk through. Why is there so much overgrown grass here? It's a complete waste to grow all these flowers. She whined. Olivia frowned unhappily upon hearing the voice. Soon, Anders' mother was about to step inside, but Olivia coldly commanded, Stand outside and wait. Anders' mom had already raised her foot to step inside. When she heard Olivia's words, a flicker of anger crossed her eyes. However, considering the girl's influential background, she glanced at Anders, awkwardly lowered her foot, and stood just outside the door. Olivia lightly tapped the table with her fingertip, and Jeremy promptly refilled the teacup in front of her. Thank you, she murmured. Then Olivia lifted the teacup, savoring it with a touch of allure. This taste is truly delightful, she remarked, appreciating the fragrant notes in it. Hello? Anders' mom couldn't bear being ignored. What kind of mockery was this? Her son was Anders Jarbaldi, the prospective head of the Jarbaldi family. Her tone turned more serious as she asked, Miss Johnson, why did you have someone call me over? The one who summoned you wasn't me. Olivia's lips curled into a smile. It was Anders. Why don't you ask him directly? Is that so? The woman turned to Anders, who stood beside her, and her voice softened. Why did you have someone call me over? Apologize to Miss Johnson, Anders stated, his gaze icy. He felt truly annoyed with his mother today. Apologize? The woman appeared bewildered. 
He wanted her to apologize? What was there to apologize for? She hadn't said a word about Olivia from start to finish. Yes, Anders said impatiently. Today, at the old house, you offended Miss Johnson. I did not, the woman countered. If you want to dispute it, you can leave. Olivia looked at them and continued. When you decide to return after reflecting on it, I'll be here. But having such a large group of people standing here is truly an eyesore. Mom? Anders gave the woman a meaningful look. Regardless of who was at fault today, she had to apologize. A little concession could prevent a major issue. The woman gritted her teeth and turned to Olivia. Miss Johnson, I was blind not to recognize my mistake earlier and offended you. I hope you, as a young adult, will overlook my transgressions and accept I really am a humble person. Please forgive me. Miss Johnson, is this acceptable? Anders looked at Olivia and inquired. No. Olivia was resolute. She intended to make things difficult for them. She wouldn't let them off so easily. Why did you admit the most crucial three words? The I am sorry part? I... Anders' mom frowned. Forced into an apology, she couldn't help but roll her eyes at the elegant woman seated in the wheelchair, sipping her tea. She silently cursed Jeremy's mother countless times in her heart. It was her own foolishness that had landed her in this predicament. My time is very precious, Olivia said. Wasting other people's time is really not a kind thing to do. She raised her wrist and looked at the time on her wristwatch. I will give you the last five seconds, either apologize genuinely or get out. Anders' patience was almost exhausted. His eyes were filled with anger as he looked at his mom. All right. Seeing that her son was becoming more and more agitated, Anders' mom, Veronica, could only clench her fist and look humiliated. Miss Johnson, I'm really sorry. Olivia watched the woman's eyes. She could tell Veronica didn't mean a thing she was saying. But then she read the woman's thoughts and her eyes flickered. Huh, interesting, she thought, seeing that the woman was hiding a secret. Olivia held the secret close for the time being. Olivia chuckled lightly and remarked, See, if you had just apologized earlier, things wouldn't have escalated to this. Setting down her teacup, she adjusted her attire and shifted into a more relaxed position. Leaning against the sofa, she added, I'm not one to stir up trouble for no reason. Since I've now received an apology, I'll let this matter go now. Thank you, Miss Johnson. Anders' expression visibly relaxed. Regardless of the circumstances, the issue was finally resolved. Oh, but I've had a question on my mind that I'd like to ask. Olivia propped her chin with one hand and inquired, Can you help with it, Anders? Um, maybe, please, go ahead. Anders nodded. If Olivia was willing to let go of her grievances first, he'd have an opportunity to maybe make inroads with her and secure her approval to move forward as potential head of the favored Jarbaldi family heir. I saw you when I arrived in San Francisco yesterday. Olivia's eyes gleamed with insight. I believe you're roughly the same age as Jeremy. What, three years older? So you should be his older brother, correct? Yet when you speak to him, you adopt the tone of an elder. It's more like you're addressing him as a little uncle rather than older brother. When Olivia spoke, she noticed Veronica's face turn especially grim. So are you Jeremy's brother or more like his little uncle? Olivia feigned puzzlement, tilting her head. I... Anders found himself unable to utter a word. His status in the Jarbaldi family was quite sensitive. His grandpa had adopted him after fostering him and taking his mother in. But there were always whispers about who his father was. He looked at his mom who looked away. Ah. Jeremy let out a chuckle a twitch at the corner of his mouth. This question was indeed a tricky one. To Anders, Jeremy's smile seemed even more glaring. It was as if Jeremy was mocking him. He responded with cold indifference. Miss Johnson, we are relatives because my grandfather adopted me. That's all there is to it. With that, he turned and made his exit. Seeing Anders preparing to leave, the others outside hastened to follow suit. Olivia was truly audacious, they thought. Even Anders couldn't afford to cross her. 
let alone outsiders who might point out the questionable goings-on within the Jarbaldi family. You may go, Olivia smiled at Veronica and her companions, adding, leave the gifts behind. Everyone was left speechless, reluctantly placing down the little gifts they had brought. One by one they left, their faces crestfallen. The final elderly man in the group looked at Olivia with a glare in his eyes, and she heard him think, I hope you get what you deserve, you little bitch. Oh, I hope I do too, Olivia thought, because I deserve the world. With that, she smiled to herself, and then with a tingling rising up through her feet and up her legs into her stomach, she flicked her finger to the left while no one was watching. Suddenly, one of the vines that ran along the garden paths in front of the group sprung up, and the elderly man tripped over it, toppling over and stumbling into his companions, so they went down one by one, like little dominoes or bowling pins. The group cursed at each other and then began bickering, telling one another to watch where they were going. Liv smiled again. As far as little acts of vengeance went, this one was relatively harmless but oh so amusing. Well worth it, I'd say, she thought before closing the door behind her and turning to face Jeremy and his mother. What a dull group. Olivia shook her head in disdain, muttering, how dull indeed. Would you like another cup of tea? Jeremy inquired, having missed the collective fall outside just beyond his view. Sure, Olivia nodded. Don't burn yourselves, it's still hot. Jeremy's mother cautioned. All right. Olivia nodded playfully, winking at Jeremy with her left eye. Jeremy caught Olivia's gesture and smiled. He proceeded to pour another cup for her. It's lunchtime, the housekeeper Sally informed them. Did you guys want something to eat? Olivia checked the time and nodded. That bunch really takes their time. They don't appear to be in a hurry to do anything except sit around all day. Is that all they do here? Yes, Jeremy agreed taking a sip of his tea. Jeremy, I'll have to trouble you to look after your mother while I go prepare lunch, Sally said. All right, Jeremy nodded. No need, Olivia waved her hand. It's a rare occasion for me to be in someone else's home as a guest. Please let me cook today as a token of my appreciation for you having me. This really isn't necessary, Sally quickly objected. She couldn't fathom allowing a guest to roll up their sleeves and cook. It's fine. Olivia waved her hand standing up. Just lead me to the kitchen. This, Sally hesitated. She glanced at her boss in the wheelchair, who remained silent. She took the silence as a sign of agreement and nodded, saying, Well, I guess it's all right. Please follow me. After Olivia departed, Jeremy and his mother turned to one another and spoke in whispers. Olivia is a wonderful girl. Jeremy's mother beamed, expressing, I'm very fond of her. Me too, Jeremy affirmed. Do you like her? Jeremy's mother asked, seeing her son's amorous look. Like her, I mean? Yes, Jeremy responded, his tone subdued. That's wonderful. Jeremy's mother nodded, her face radiating joy. Does she have feelings for you too? I don't think so. Jeremy sighed ruefully. Really? Jeremy's mother was taken aback. Are you sure? Mom, would you like another cup of tea? Jeremy smoothingly changed the subject. No. Shaking her head, Jeremy's mother began to fret about her son's marriage. Does she have someone she's interested in? I'm not sure. Jeremy shook his head. She's engaged, though. Engaged? Jeremy's mother clearly hadn't anticipated this. At her age? Yes, Jeremy concurred. It wasn't good. It's more of like, I don't know, a business thing between their two families. I guess her maternal grandpa and the Jones family agreed a long time ago they would marry, so their business interests would be protected. You know how wealthy families are. They're always intermarrying. He shrugged. Maybe that's why the other great families hated the Park family, because they tried to marry their granddaughter off to the Jones family. He laughed. Ugh, Jeremy's mother sighed. Such a wonderful girl. How sad she was caught up in all the silly infighting between such storied families. Observing his mother's expression, 
Jeremy recollected what had happened last year and chuckled. What's the matter? Why are you laughing? Mom, this is what I've been dealing with for months. I can't help myself. I'm drawn to her, but I don't know. She seems drawn to Chris Jones. I'm always destined to be the friend. Oh, my poor son. Jeremy's mother teased lovingly. Jer, if you truly like her, you must take the initiative to pursue her. If she doesn't reciprocate your feelings, that's fine. However, if she's moved by you, there could be something there. But you have to at least tell her so she knows how you feel. Concluding her words, she sighed lightly. You've always been rather aloof since you were young, especially after your father passed away. This is the first time I've seen you so dedicated to someone. If you care for her, then just relax and boldly express your feelings. Hmm. Jeremy nodded. Olivia is a wonderful girl. I'm fond of her. Jeremy's mother nodded and smiled. I see. Jeremy discerned that his mother hadn't been this happy in a long while. Okay, he nodded, mustering up the courage with his mom's encouragement. Maybe I will say something to Olivia. Elsewhere, on the Garibaldi family estate, Anders and his own mother, Veronica, were engaged in a heated discussion. Anders' mother had been incessantly complaining since leaving Jeremy's residence. She's truly uncouth imposing herself on others' homes. I have no idea how her parents raised her. Are you finished talking? Anders couldn't bear it any longer. He stood tall and imposing in front of his mother, thoroughly irritated. Ever since Livia had asked him pointed questions about who he was in relation to Jeremy, Anders had begun to suspect his mother might actually know the answers. So he turned and prepared to ask her point blank. I... Veronica said, vexed. Why should I stop talking? Am I not good enough for you? How can you speak to your mom like that? She had just quietly apologized to Olivia on her son's behalf in front of so many people. What about her own dignity? Anders turned around and glanced at the maid who kept her head lowered behind his mother. He gestured dismissively. If you're going to keep talking, then leave. The maid lowered her head even further upon seeing this. She quickly entered the house. Witnessing that Anders was about to lose his temper, she knew she had to depart promptly to avoid getting caught in the crossfire. But Veronica stayed put. Very well. Your abstinence is truly remarkable. Anders sneered. No one excelled at being a burden quite like his mother. What's with that tone? Veronica felt deeply uncomfortable. Haven't I done enough for you? Enough? Anders sneered, adding, You've done far too much. You! Veronica knew precisely what Anders was alluding to. She felt stifled and raised her hands in frustration. I am your mother. I've never questioned that. Anders asserted, I'm simply uncertain about who my father is. At the mention of his father, Anders' mother's face alternated between paler and flushed anger. Go on. Anders looked at her icily. Answer Olivia Johnson's question, she asked. Enlighten me. Who am I? Am I Jeremy's brother? Or his uncle? Who am I? When Anders was questioned by Olivia earlier, he glanced over to see his mother watching horrified, and he realized in that moment exactly what Olivia was trying to say. Now he just needed his mother to admit it. My father has never gone missing, has he? You were just some woman trying to sleep with wealthy men for handouts and you slept with Jeremy's father and my grandfather. And once you got pregnant, you went to my grandpa and said I was his kid or his grandkid. And you'd go away if he just paid you, didn't you? Growing up, Anders had heard about people doing this. He heard about women trying to entrap successful athletes and businessmen. His mother's lips quivered. She had never anticipated so many things to unfold while she was slightly intoxicated nor did she want it. Tell me. Tell me. Anders' hands tightened their grip on her shoulders, his eyes blazing with loathing as she wished to consume everything. You're hurting me. The woman wriggled. Stop. Anders released her when he heard her cry out in pain. He shoved her away, turning his back on her, 
and walked into the house, disregarding her entirely. The woman clutched her arms, her body resembling a wilted celery stalk. She lowered her head and cried. How had Olivia known? Years ago, Veronica used to hang out at the Four Seasons Bar in Beverly Hills and chat up visiting men on business. When Jeremy's father and grandpa came through to do business on an extended trip, she ended up having alliances with both. When she fell pregnant, she went to Jeremy's grandpa and told him. She wasn't sure who the father was, but she knew it was a Jarbaldi. She hadn't done it to secure money. No, she was truly looking for a partner, hoping to find a wealthy husband. Hearing this, the Jarbaldi patriarch took pity on her and offered to take Veronica in as a member of his staff and adopt her son as a foster son, telling everyone Anders' father had skipped out on him. Jeremy's grandpa saw having one more male heir as a potential benefit to his family's empire, someone to send to helm one of their businesses around the world should they need it. But he made her sign an NDA so she could never tell anyone, not even her son, the truth. Now, though some little wench had walked into their house and seemed to insinuate everything, Olivia had exposed her secret, and Veronica's silence confirmed it to her son. The truth was, Veronica never knew who Anders' father's was. She didn't know if he was Jeremy's half-brother or his uncle, and the shame kept her from finding out. She hadn't intended on her son finding out. She didn't want the shame to befall him, too. Could it really be her fault? Was it truly her entire fault? Anders ran towards his own villa on the family's property and ran up the stairs to his room before slamming the door. Then he spun around and kicked the door forcefully. Why did this woman have to be his mother? This slut. Why didn't children possess the right to choose their parents? And on top of that, he hadn't even been accorded the right to know about any of it. The missing man he had called his father for over a decade wasn't his biological father at all. The individual he had referred to as his grandfather for over 10 years was potentially his father. What kind of twisted relationship was this? Just then his phone rang. Anders retrieved his phone and glimpsed at the caller ID. He paused for a moment before answering the call with a serious expression. Hello? How are things progressing? A deep male voice emanated from the other end of the line. Don't worry. Everything is proceeding as planned. Anders responded respectfully. Good. The man acknowledged. Remember, don't be lenient on anyone. I understand. Anders affirmed. Keep in mind that we can cast you aside just as effortlessly as we can elevate you to where you want to go. The man cautioned. You just need to tell us everything that happens within the Jorabaldi family. I know. Anders responded, maintaining a demeanor of respect, though a glimmer of dissatisfaction flickered in his eyes. Has anything noteworthy occurred within the family compound in the last 48 hours? The man inquired. After a brief pause, Anders stated, Everything is normal. Jeremy has returned. Don't fret over him. The man dismissed with disdain. He can't pose much of a threat. Understood. Anders replied. Did he return voluntary? The man probed. Anders parted his lips. Yes. I see what needs to be done. The man said. Keep an eye on him. Report to me if anything significant transpires. The man instructed. Okay. Anders assented. After hanging up, Anders clenched his fist. He didn't want to be someone else's puppet for the rest of his life. He wondered if maybe Olivia Johnson would be his chance to do anything about that. Does it taste okay? Olivia gazed at Celeste Jarbaldi, seated across from her. Yes, it's very delicious. Jeremy's mother nodded. It had been a long time since she had savored such delightful food. Then have some more. Olivia smiled. And if there's anything else you'd like, just let me know. I'd be happy to cook for you tonight. That would be asking too much of you. Jeremy's mother gently shook her head. I'm already so grateful for this meal. It's no trouble. Olivia smiled. Cooking is a new hobby of mine. Ugh. Jeremy's mother couldn't help but sigh. How could such a wonderful girl not be her son's girlfriend? Jeremy and Liv clearly got along so well. What's the matter? Olivia looked at Celeste. Doesn't it suit your taste? 
No, it's perfect. Celeste smiled and said, Liv's cooking skills are truly excellent. As long as you enjoy it, Olivia smiled, feeling a pang of sympathy for Celeste. Jeremy's mother smiled and said, This must be your first visit to San Francisco, right? Yes, Olivia nodded. It's my first time here. Well, there's a parade in the city later today, Sally, the housekeeper, added, placing an extra platter of chicken on the table. They were talking about it on TV today. A parade? Olivia became a little intrigued. Yep, it's a fun parade that celebrates the founding of the city, and everyone gets dressed up and runs through the city. After lunch, Jeremy, take Liv around for a bit and show her some of it. Jeremy's mother said with a smile. All right. Jeremy nodded. He knew his mother was trying to help him, so he smiled and said, It's not over until evening, though. It's fine to return late. Jeremy's mother said, You're on vacation, and I'm sure your friend wants to get a sense of the city. No sense just making her sit inside and be surrounded by her crazy family the whole time she's here. Celeste joked. Okay, Jeremy replied. After lunch, Olivia and Jeremy left the house and ventured out to watch the parade. A little while after, Anders came to Jeremy and Celeste's villa. When he knocked on the door, Celeste answered. Where's Jeremy? He asked, poking his head in the house. He took Miss Johnson out. Jeremy's mother replied. Where did they go? Anders furrowed his brow. They left the city. Jeremy's mother smiled and said, I think they went to the coast or something. She wouldn't let Anders interfere and jeopardize her son's chances. Why so far? Anders frowned. Are they planning on being back later? I'm not sure if they'll be back. Jeremy's mother shook her head. Anders scowled. Thanks. Anders turned and departed without saying goodbye. Take care. Jeremy's mother smiled softly. Madam, Sally, the housekeeper, handed a cup of warm water to Celeste. You've become quite skilled at telling fibs. Yes, Jeremy's mother smiled, recalling her former self. Whenever she lied, her eyes would betray her, revealing panic and avoidance. She was easily caught in her lies because she couldn't make eye contact. It used to embarrass her greatly. It's a blessing in disguise, these bad eyes of mine. Now that she couldn't see anymore, she could deceive more easily. Madam, your eyes will recover. Sally, the housekeeper, frowned slightly. Will they? Jeremy's mother said with a faint smile. I've already come to terms with it. As long as Jeremy and Devin are doing well, that's all that matters. Sally nodded. She shared the sentiment, hoping her boss's children would lead long and happy lives. The sun feels really warm today. Jeremy's mother gently closed her eyes, basking in the golden rays streaming through the window. Yes. Sally, the housekeeper, agreed. It's a beautiful sunny day. Hopefully, nothing would ruin this beautiful day. Olivia and Jeremy explored the city, encountering the fun, lively parade, and dancing along to the music of a passing live band. They enjoyed themselves, strolling from afternoon till dusk. In the evening, Jeremy took Olivia to a renowned restaurant in San Francisco, and finally, after their meal, they returned home. They spent the entire afternoon like this, and Olivia's spirits were high. It had been a while since she'd experienced such carefree enjoyment. In this unfamiliar city, she felt a surprising sense of ease. San Francisco is truly fascinating, Olivia remarked with a smile. The parade was so fun, the drumming was really cool too. If you enjoyed it? Jeremy paused, then asked, Would you consider staying? Stay? Olivia shook her head with a smile. Well, I mean, maybe you could go to college out here. Olivia considered. I don't know, my home is in New York, but I wouldn't find a sense of belonging here. To Olivia, wherever Victoria was, that was home. And I have too much to do out there, she thought. Too many names to cross off my list still. I see. Jeremy nodded, opting to remain silent. The air hung still for a moment before he ventured. How are things between you and Chris? Him? 
Olivia pursed her lips, recalling the time Chris abruptly ended their call recently after insinuating their relationship was maybe more than just an arrangement. Oh, you know, it is what it is, she replied. What more could she really say? What more did she really know? Do you like him? Jeremy inquired. Well, how could she answer that? It's confusing. I see, Jeremy responded without pressing further. My mother holds you in high regard. I can sense that, Olivia nodded. I hold her in high regard too. It was the first time she'd encountered someone so beautiful and delicate and sweet. Every time she saw her smile, it exuded a kind of gentle serenity. Olivia almost felt healed by Celeste's smile. It was hard to explain, but her heart ached for everything the woman had been through. I... Jeremy attempted to confess, but found the words eluding him. He truly had no experience in matters like this. I... she... she wishes... Hmm? Olivia looked at Jeremy, her eyes sparkling. This was the first time she'd seen Jeremy stutter like this. What does she wish? She... Jeremy gazed into Olivia's shining eyes, his heart pounding. He clenched his fists, feeling a surge of courage. Do you like my mom? Yes, I do, Olivia confirmed. Didn't I just say so? Well, she really approves of you too, and um, in that case, would you be open to deepening the relationship? Jeremy asked tentatively. If their relationship could progress further, it would be wonderful. A deeper connection? Olivia pondered for a moment, her eyes lighting up. Sure. Really? Jeremy's eyes also brightened, feeling as if he were floating on air. Yes, Olivia nodded, grinning. As long as she's comfortable with it, I'd be honored to maybe be her pen pal or something. I know she's lonely and she seems like she's in need of a friend, especially in that compound surrounded by all your weird family members. So I'm happy to keep up a correspondence with her if that's what you're asking. Jeremy was momentarily stunned. His emotions were a whirlwind. He felt like he was falling without a parachute. Olivia was too busy thinking about his slightly strange request to read his thoughts. That's so sweet, she thought. Jeremy is just worried about his mother being lonely after his dad passed, and now that his grandpa is sick. So maybe he just wants her to feel happier. I wonder if maybe his sister doesn't keep in contact with her that much. Oh well, if that would make her happy, I'll do it. Olivia nodded, contented with herself. When they arrived back at Jeremy's house later that night, Olivia told Jeremy's mother, Celeste, Jeremy and I talked earlier, and we both agreed that it would be fun to maybe have an email correspondence with you once I leave and go back to New York. Jeremy, just let me know you might like that. Uh, Jeremy's mother was taken aback. She didn't wish to take on a pen pal. She was hoping for her son to have a girlfriend. Celeste was bewildered. Was this her son's indirect approach to asking Liv out? Or had he given up entirely? What do you think? Olivia asked, looking at Jeremy's mother. Of course, I'd be delighted to keep in touch even after you leave. Jeremy's mother smiled. Wonderful, Olivia beamed. As she opened her mouth to speak some more, her phone began to ring. Oh shoot, it's my mom, hold on. Celeste could see the photo that popped up alongside the name. Victoria Park on Liv's caller ID and her brows furrowed. Wait, is that Vicky? Huh? Liv asked as she answered the phone. Hi, Mom, she said quietly. Wait, Celeste said, her lips breaking into a smile. Ask your mom if she remembers a Celeste Jarbaldi. Olivia repeated the question into her phone, and Victoria said, Sally? Thinking quickly, Olivia quickly took a selfie beside Jeremy and Celeste and texted it to her mother. Within seconds, Victoria said, Oh my god, Celeste, hi! Wow, you're really becoming more and more beautiful each year. Olivia, sensing her mother's excitement, handed the phone over to Celeste. You're quite amazing, Celeste Garibaldi smiled and said. Unfortunately, you're also lying. I've been aging rapidly, she joked. As Celeste and Victoria fell quickly into old banter, Jeremy beckoned Olivia to come outside with him so he could show her his back garden. She obliged as Celeste continued to talk to Victoria inside. 
You're not old, Victoria said. Have you not looked in the mirror? I... Celeste Garibaldi paused for a moment and said, I had a car accident a few years ago. My eyes aren't very good. Oh my god. Victoria frowned and said, I'm so sorry. How did this happen? Let's not dwell on that. How's life for you now? Celeste Garibaldi asked. It's quite good. Victoria lightly smiled and said, Liv is a hard-working girl. I'm leading a happy life now. I didn't put together that you would be in San Francisco when Liv said she was visiting her friend. I always knew you by your maiden name. No worries, but speaking of which, Celeste said, Do you remember what we said back then? If you marry and have children in the future, we'll make our kids date and get married so we can go on vacations together and raise grandbabies together. She laughed. I remember. Victoria smiled. Those were good times. It's good that you remember. Celeste Garibaldi's lips curved up. Because after meeting your daughter, I'd like to take us up on that. She jested. Funny. Victoria laughed, though she was sort of stunned. She had gone years with nobody caring about her or Olivia, but she forgot how interested people could be when they knew a new person came from a wealthy, successful family. Isn't it nice to make the relationship even more complicated? Celeste Arvaldi joked. Gosh, do you remember how I used to borrow your notes in high school? Yeah, and you used to give me half your lunch because I always hated mine. Recollecting the past, they both laughed, marveling at how time flew by. It never seemed to offer them a moment's rest. Vicky, Celeste said, I really do like your daughter. She's sweet, and she and my son really seem to get along. That's so sweet, but I think my daughter is already with another boy. Victoria sighed. I know. Celeste Garibaldi sighed. Well, you know how teens are. They're always changing their minds. So I suppose, why don't we just let Liv choose for herself? If she truly doesn't like my son, then it's my son's loss and I'll accept it. Seems fair. Victoria nodded. She too hoped that Olivia would take the initiative to seeking her own happiness. Victoria's own marriage had been a failure and she wished for her daughter to find joy. She hoped to witness Olivia be a bride one day and to see Olivia's children playfully running around. It would give her the opportunity to be a grandmother and experience the boundless joys that brought. Celeste, when can we meet? Why don't you come back with Liv and your son when they return? How long has it been since you've come back to New York City? Oh, it's been lifetimes, it feels like. Celeste Garibaldi interrupted Victoria's words, reaching out to caress her legs that were now unresponsive. I've already put down roots on the West Coast and I can't leave anymore. This is our home. Where my family and I belong, I'm here and nowhere else. All right. Victoria heard this and didn't press any further. Then I'll have to trouble you to take care of Liv for the next few days. It's no trouble. Celeste smiled and said, there's still a 50% chance of her becoming my son's girlfriend. <laughs> Victoria laughed and said, You. The two chatted a while longer until Victoria heard a knock on the bedroom door and asked, What is it? I made some supper. Michael opened the door and said, I noticed you didn't eat much for dinner, so I made some chicken tenders. Come out and have some. Victoria nodded. I'll be out in a bit. Okay. Michael saw Victoria on the phone and closed the door without saying more. Hurry up. I got it. Victoria playfully dragged out her response. Wow, you're so lucky. Your husband even made late night snacks for you? Celeste teased. No, I've... Victoria wanted to explain but didn't know how to put it. All right, all right, I won't pry. Go enjoy your wontons. Celeste teased Victoria a bit more before ending the call. Victoria looked at the phone in her hand and shook her head. It was truly hard to explain what was going on with Michael and her. He was her ex-husband, but whose ex-husband was up making chicken tenders for them in the middle of the night? If you don't eat them, they'll go to waste. Michael's voice came from outside the door. Got it. Victoria shook her head. It wasn't worth telling him no and offending him over chicken tenders. The following morning, at dawn, Chris Jones and Sven arrived at the airport like two men possessed. Chris, I will go and get our boarding passes, Sven said. 
As soon as Sven left, Chris's phone vibrated in his pocket. He picked up the phone and looked at the caller ID. Chris frowned unhappily. After hesitating for a moment, he picked up the phone. Wyatt, hi. Do you know what time it is now? Where you are? I don't know. I'm in Las Vegas. Wyatt Newman answered. Chris raised his eyebrows. There was no one else in the world who was more annoying at the moment than Wyatt Newman. If you have something to say, say it. Where's your fiancé? Wyatt asked, not mincing words. You are looking for Liv? Why? What are you doing? Chris asked. You've decided to return her dog Polly to her? She's called Betty. Wyatt corrected Chris. Polly sounds much better. Chris curled his lips and said, So what do you want? Betty misses her very much. Although he didn't want to admit it, ever since he had brought Betty home from Olivia's, the Husky's emotions had been very unstable, and he had thought of many ways to make her happy, but none seemed to work. Betty had lost a lot of weight during this period of time. He really had no choice but to not let them see each other. You don't want me to bring Liv to Las Vegas, do you? Chris frowned. Are you going to give Polly back to her? It's called Betty, Wyatt said. I'll book you a flight to Atlantic City tomorrow from wherever you are. Atlantic City? Chris smiled and said. Wow, is Las Vegas not enough for you? You got a gamble in Jersey now? I have my new casino in Atlantic City, Wyatt replied. Betty and I will wait for you and Olivia there. With that, Wyatt immediately hung up. Chris looked around, wondering what to do. Chris frowned. Had Wyatt Newman actually hung up on him? The nerve. Chris, it's time to get to the gate. Let's go, Sven said. Damn it. Chris cursed in a low voice and left the place with big steps. What's the matter all of a sudden? Sven was confused. Chris was still fine just now. With a blank expression, Sven immediately followed with quick steps. Hello, Chris. Wait for me. Great, Sven thought. Nothing like coast-to-coast -coast travel with a moody Chris Jones. What a treat for me. He rolled his eyes and reluctantly followed his boss through security. When the two of them arrived in San Francisco, it was almost dawn. Chris raised his watch and looked at it. Get someone to prepare the gifts and leave for the Darbaldi estate. Chris, don't you want to rest for a while? Sven asked. In order to come to San Francisco, Chris had front-loaded the week's workload and compressed it into one and a half days. In order to get everything done, it meant foregoing resting and sleeping for a while. Chris didn't even eat much. He had only rested for two or three hours on the plane. If this continued, his body would get sick. I'm fine. He wanted to get in front of Olivia and personally talk to her about what was going on between them. All right, Sven nodded. Then I'll call a car over. Okay. Chris nodded and looked at the star in the sky. He frowned slightly. Olivia, what am I going to do with you? He wondered. He hadn't stopped thinking about her for days now. At the same time, in the guest room on the second floor of Jamie's villa on the Jarbaldi family estate, Olivia hugged the blanket and turned over to sleep more soundly. A bright moon was hidden in the clouds outside the clear floor-to-ceiling window. A star was shining in the sky, as if it was saying goodnight to anyone who glanced up at it. As the sky gradually brightened and night gave way to morning, Olivia finally woke up at a leisurely pace, taking her time getting up from bed. She turned her body and stretched her legs, the corner of her mouth unconsciously raised. It was strange being here, but there was also something peaceful about waking up in this room. Something about Jeremy's mom had a calming effect. With a whisper, Olivia hugged the blanket from the bed and sat up. She rubbed her eyes and got up to wash up and change her clothes. She looked at her outfit in front of the mirror, a simple button-down white shirt and chic blue high-waisted trousers, and Olivia nodded her head in satisfaction. Today, she wanted to talk to Jeremy's great-uncle again, the same man who had insulted her yesterday, who she learned was named Jebediah Garibaldi. She had seen through him yesterday morning. There was something fishy about him, and she didn't trust him around Jeremy. After exiting the bedroom, Olivia lightly traipsed down the wooden staircase. 
When she reached the first floor, she heard a sound of laughter coming from the kitchen. Morning, Olivia greeted. Olivia, you're up finally. Celeste smiled and said, Come over quickly, your friend is here. My friend? Olivia stood stunned. She turned around and looked at the kitchen where she saw someone she knew. Morning, little lady. Sven grinned as he waved his hand. Morning? Olivia nodded and looked at him. Then she looked at Chris, who sat watching her intently. Why are you guys here? Chris frowned when he heard Olivia's question. I missed you, Chris said matter-of-factly. Sven saw Chris's expression change and quickly stood, as if that he could ease the sudden tension in the room. Really? Olivia glanced at Chris. Was he really that afraid of her coming here and never wanting her to come back to New York or something? Does he really miss her? He actually chased her to San Francisco? Yes, Sven said with a smile. Olivia did not reply but walked to the seat she sat at yesterday and sat down. The maid standing beside the stove hurriedly started to prepare her breakfast. Were you coming to San Francisco to attend our parade yesterday, Chris? Jeremy curled his lips. Unfortunately, it ended yesterday. You came a day late. That's a pity, Chris casually said. Did you go? Yes, Olivia and I went, Jeremy said. Jeremy's words were full of daggers, as if he was staking a claim to live. Really? Chris glanced at Olivia. This fiancé of his has been really busy lately. She actually wanted to travel across the country with another guy and start hanging out one-on-one -on -one with him. Chris, since the parade is already over, you should go back. Jeremy gave the order to leave. There's no hurry. Chris looked at Olivia. Olivia, when are you going back to New York? I don't know. I think I should wait for a few days. Olivia replied. There was obviously something fishy going on in San Francisco between the Garibaldis. How could she leave at this time? Then I will wait for you for a few days too, Chris said. You will wait for me? Olivia raised her eyebrows and a trace of displeasure appeared in her heart. Was there a need to not trust her so much? She did not treat Chris badly. Was he so worried that she would get too close to others in the seven families? Yeah, you are my fiancé. Who would I be waiting for besides you? Chris looked at Olivia with a focused gaze. <clears throat> Celeste Gerbaldi coughed a few times and looked in Chris's direction. You are Olivia's fiancé? Yes. Chris answered. Then I'll have to trouble you to come closer. Celeste Garibaldi frowned slightly. A love rival had come to her doorstep, and she wanted to inspect him. She was interrupted when breakfast was served, so she told her son to invite Chris and Sven to join her, Jeremy, and Olivia for a meal. That way, she could watch and inspect Chris more closely. Jeremy reluctantly did as his mother asked and sulked throughout the entire meal. After breakfast, Olivia prepared to pay Jeremy's great-uncle Jebediah another visit according to her original plan. Just as she walked out of the villa, Chris also followed. Olivia. Hmm? Olivia stopped in her tracks. Is something the matter? Yes. Chris glanced at Jeremy. Jeremy looked at Olivia. I uh, left some stuff in the house, he said, taking the hint and deciding it best to give them a moment alone. I will go back and get it. Okay, Olivia nodded. Jeremy took a deep look at Chris, turned around and walked back to the house. Sven also followed quickly. Come, 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 I will go with you to get it. No need. No, no, I insist, Sven said. And I said you don't need to. Trust me. Jeremy and Sven's voices gradually faded away, and Olivia and Chris, standing a few yards outside the door faced each other. Olivia's eyes narrowed and she sensed herself growing impatient with Chris. Olivia. Chris saw Olivia's attitude and felt a little sad. Chris? Olivia looked at Chris. Do you really not trust me so much with Jeremy that you had to chase me across the country to come check in on me? What did you say? Chris was stunned. Since when did he not trust her? I made a deal with you first before anyone. I know I said I would form an alliance with Jeremy and Steve recently, 
but that's for a different thing and doesn't supersede what I have with you. Olivia said, It's just that the seven families have let down my mom's family. It's only a matter of time before they try to hurt or punish me to get back at my mom's dad. Since you know that the seven great families want to hurt you, why did you take the initiative to send yourself to them to seek death? Olivia, are you stupid coming here into the prime Garibaldi territory? Chris got angry when he mentioned this matter. I am stupid? Olivia pointed at herself. Wow, Chris, you think highly of yourself, huh? I think highly of myself? Chris pointed at himself. Olivia, don't be unreasonable. I am unreasonable? Olivia sneered and said, Chris, it was you who did not trust me first, not the other way around. Chris shook his head. Why don't you think I trust you? If you trusted me, would you chase after me? Olivia frowned and said, Jeremy and I are just friends. I care about him, but that doesn't mean I have anything to do with the seven families just because he's a Garibaldi. And it doesn't mean I will go back on the agreement I have with you or even betray you. When did I tell you that I'm worried about this? Chris was confused. You don't have to deny it, Olivia said. If you are really not worried at all, what is your reason for coming here? I... I... Chris hesitated. He didn't even know how to explain that he had come to tell her his feelings because he was so confused and also not used to feeling things, and so his head was so cloudy that he couldn't make a coherent thought to express himself. Didn't she see that all his goodwill and adoration were real? Olivia was too impatient to bother to read Chris's mind. Well, you suddenly have nothing else to say? Olivia curls her lips. Chris, please don't come here insulting my sense of loyalty. My agreement with you and my ultimate goals have not changed. I will not do something that goes against my word. Also, the more Chris heard, the more he felt Olivia wasn't understanding his reason for coming here at all. With one step forward, Chris supported himself against the wall with one hand and then lifted Olivia's chin towards him with the other. You really don't see it, do you? He really liked her. He wanted to keep her by his side forever. He wanted to see that kind of beauty when he opened his eyes every day. Olivia, I know you have your goals and your ambitions, and you have a whole world of friends and family and your business and a million things you do. But listen carefully. I don't want to pass by your world like some background character. I want to be your world, or at least a big part of it. He felt like he was suddenly reciting some silly love poem to a girl, the kind he mocked and rolled his eyes at in the past. But now he couldn't help himself. He had already said it out loud, and he was being so clear. Olivia should understand plainly now how he felt, right? Olivia raised her eyebrows. Are you trying to imprison me? What? Chris was speechless. Any other girl would have seen his admission as a lovesick confession. But of course, Olivia saw it as a threat. As if liking her, or asking her to be in a relationship, would take away her freedom or something. After saying that, Liv turned around and started back inside. Chris immediately used his hand to block Olivia, and he put his arms completely around her so he was hugging her. Chris, what exactly are you trying to do? Olivia frowned. You are about to exhaust my patience. I have already said that I will not betray you when it comes to our agreement, don't you understand? Don't get so close to me, don't block me, and don't scare me. Her patience was also limited. Chris frowned. His love was so obvious, but she seemed so obtuse. What else could he do? If you continue like this, I really have to reconsider whether our agreement still has any value to carry on. Olivia said coldly. Sure, she'd heard his confession, but with a mission like hers, she worried that spending too much time on a relationship would get in the way of her taking revenge on those who still had to pay for what they had done to her. After she'd sought vengeance, she could turn to love and joy. But first, she had to make sure her mother and friends and her dad were all going to be okay. She had to use her powers and her second chance to help people, even if she did have some sort of mutual feelings. No, she thought, don't give it another thought. You have to stay focused on your mission, Liv. What did you say? Chris got angry when he heard Olivia say she wanted to cancel the contract. 
Do you really mean that? I... I... Olivia choked and took a deep breath. Olivia said, Chris, let me tell you seriously. If you try to make something deeper than just a mutually beneficial agreement between two parties right now... Before she could finish, she felt Chris's lips on hers. Olivia was stunned. She felt unwell. What was this Chris doing? After recovering from her shock, Olivia stretched out her hand and was about to push him away, but she stopped herself. Part of her didn't want to move just yet. Chris held her slender wrist with one hand above her head and tightly wrapped his other hand around her waist. He pressed her against the wall and kissed her on the lips again. After a long time, he bit her lower lip in revenge, as if to say, No more teasing me, you hear? Ow! Olivia was in pain. Was this guy crazy? He dared to bite her. Staring angrily at Chris, Olivia opened her mouth and asked, What exactly are you trying to do? What kind of crazy thing are you doing so early in the morning? Just showing you I like being around you. Chris teased as he pressed his index finger against Olivia's lower lip. Can't you just admit you like being around me too? Olivia smiled and her lips parted slightly. Then she lowered her head and bit Chris's finger. Unlike his, her bite was not light. Chris was stunned as Olivia smiled. God, you must get away with stuff like this all the time because of your good looks, huh? Well, sorry, I've got stuff to do today. As Chris and Olivia talked outside, Jeremy watched through the shutters inside, his heart filled with envy. I've seen that look before, Sven sighed. You're not the first guy who had a crush on a girl that Chris Jones swooped in and wooed from right under the nose. Sven put his arm on Jeremy's shoulder and said, Get out of here as soon as possible so that you don't get hurt in the end. Jeremy glanced at Sven coldly and said, You should tell Chris that, actually. Ah, Sven smiled. Not bad, you are ambitious. Hmm. Sven snorted coldly and walked towards Olivia. At the same moment, Olivia let go of Chris's hand outside. Come on, let's go, Olivia said as she glared at Chris. Then she called out for Jeremy and led him down to the old house where all the elder Jarbaldis were. Although the old house gave Olivia a very uncomfortable feeling, she was sure it was better than the feeling her interaction with Chris had just given her. At least she wasn't left with any lingering confusion when she thought about the elders. Jeremy followed Olivia and coldly glanced at Chris as he did. Their eyes were locked in a stalemate. After Liv and Jeremy left, Sven looked at Chris's red finger and murmured, This little lady is really vicious with her words. Chris looked at the neat rows of teeth prints on his finger and smiled. Seems so. Chris? Sven pursed his lips. I suspect you are a masochist. Chris rolled his eyes at him. Don't be silly. You were bitten like this by Liv, and yet you are still so happy. If you are not a masochist, then what are you? Sven curled his lips and muttered. Observing Chris walking down the garden path, Sven asked, Chris, where are you going? I'm going to visit Jeremy's grandfather. Chris straightened his face and became serious. It seemed that if he did not solve the Garibaldi's family's infighting problem as soon as possible, he would not be able to take Olivia away from this place. Huh? Jeremy's grandfather? Didn't he suffer from a severe illness recently and nearly die? Sven followed behind Chris and asked, Who knows? Chris shrugged. Seeing was believing. He needed to see it with his own eyes to be sure. Chris, wait for me! Sven quickly followed. I really don't know where you get so much energy. Chris decided to ignore Sven's incessant chatter and quickened his pace. Elsewhere, in the elder's house on the property, where she had been before, Olivia felt dizzy the moment she arrived at the old house. She stabilized her body and followed Jeremy to the room they had been in yesterday. After knocking on the door and entering, she saw Anders and Jebediah Gerbaldi chatting about something. Jebediah sat once again in the center seat at the round table in the center of the room. Anders stood respectfully at his side. Olivia shifted her gaze to the two of them, the relationship between the two of them was really unusual. Anders' degree of protection for this great uncle was beyond what Olivia imagined was normal. 
She had already wanted him to apologize yesterday. But now that she saw him again, the feeling became even stronger. She smiled, deciding to try again. Oh, to what do I owe the pleasure of your presence here today? Jebediah asked. Knowing Olivia's identity, his attitude was much better today. He picked up his teacup, looked at Jeremy, and then looked at Olivia. Olivia said she wanted to visit you again. Jeremy replied coldly, looking at Jebediah without any emotion in his eyes. Visit me! His great uncle raised the corner of his mouth. I don't need Miss Johnson to worry about me, my bones are still strong. We don't know that for sure, Olivia said with a faint smile. I heard that your family's patriarch is so ill that he can't even hold the birthday feast. You are his younger brother. If your brother is ill at his age, perhaps you will be like that soon too, Olivia said as her eyes firmly locked onto Anders. When she saw Anders' furious expression, Olivia's mind moved and she heard both men's thoughts. Anders cursing in his heart was much worse than his great uncle's. Olivia covered her mouth and said, I'm really sorry. Sometimes I speak without thinking. If I speak too directly or harshly, please don't hold it against me. It's fine. Jeremy's great uncle put his teacup on the table with a cold glare. Miss Johnson, did you have anything else you needed? I just have another question to ask. Olivia looked at the two of them. What is the relationship between the two of you? What do you mean? Anders frowned. My great uncle is a highly respected elder in the family and the younger brother of the patriarch of our family. What do you think our relationship is? That's hard to say. Olivia smiled and shook her head. Your family background is so chaotic. No one can say for sure. After saying this, Olivia turned her gaze to Jeremy's great uncle and listened to his thoughts. She could see that he too knew about Anders' fishy lineage. Seeing that Anders was about to scold her, Olivia smiled apologetically and said, Oops, I'm really sorry. If I continue standing here, I'm really afraid that I will offend the two of you. <laughs> After saying that, Olivia turned around the room and left. Jeremy left with her. How did such a person become Theodore Long's apprentice? Jebediah thought. Was Theodore blind to her manners? Seeing the two of them leave the room, the great uncle slammed the table and looked at Anders. Something has happened. Now that someone from the Jones family and Jorgensen family have come to see Miss Johnson here, I'm afraid the plan will have to be postponed. What are you afraid of? Anders clenched his fist. Olivia had completely angered him. If there are a few more of them here, it just means she'll have to be buried with a few more bodies. Anders, have patience. Everything is for the greater good. Do not let your emotions affect your decisions, Jebediah reminded. All right, Anders nodded. Jebediah, as long as we can survive the day after tomorrow, we will send them all to hell. At that time, the entire Jarbaldi family will be ours. Okay, Jebediah nodded his head lightly. His eyes were shining with the light of desire. He had waited for this day too long. Anders, you just have to be careful, he cautioned. We have been patient for so many years so we cannot be rash and fall at the last moment. I know, Anders nodded. Jebediah, don't worry. We will never forget your kindness and loyalty to us. Good, Jebediah nodded in relief and looked elsewhere with a cunning gleam in his eyes. He was the only one who knew all the secrets of the Jarbaldi family. Well, he and his older brother. But his older brother would soon be dead. Anders clenched his fist tightly. He didn't like what was unfolding in front of him. He didn't like the chaos Olivia's presence was unleashing in his family. And he hated that she had brought the Jones and Jorgensons to his door. Die. All of you die, he thought. Anyone who stands in my way must go. Anders' eyes were filled with brutality and bloodthirst. After leaving the old house, Olivia asked Jeremy to bring her to the hospital where his grandpa was being cared for. Taking the elevator to the VIP ward on the top floor, Olivia raised her eyebrows. How is this a hospital? 
she muttered. This is more like the presidential suite of a five-star hotel. Everything was perfectly appointed, and it was much more luxurious than anything she had seen yet in San Francisco. The hospital room exuded an opulence that rivaled a regal palace. Ornate gold accents adorned the walls, framing intricately designed tapestries that depicted scenes of serene gardens and noble figures. The flooring was made of polished marble, cool to the touch, and adorned with plush, Parisian-style rugs that added an extra layer of grandeur. The hospital bed, with its towering canopy draped in rich, velvety fabric, stood as the centerpiece, fit for a monarch. A crystal chandelier hung from the ceiling, casting a warm, soft glow that danced across the room's lavish furnishings. The windows, draped in heavy brocade curtains, framed a view of the city that seemed almost surreal from such a sumptuous sanctuary. Every detail, from the glistening crystal vases filled with fresh flowers to the carefully curated art on the walls, spoke of opulence and luxury beyond compare. This room was a testament to extravagance, a haven of comfort that transcended the boundaries of a mere hospital suite. How was such a large room made for simply lying on a bed? Grandpa? Jeremy looked at the old man lying by the window as soon as they entered. To be honest, his grandpa had treated everyone in their family well. Someone had suggested he disown Jeremy, his sister and his mother after his father's death, but it was their grandpa who had refused to even entertain the matter. When he was young, Jeremy's grandpa had told him and his sister Devin a lot of stories. Sometimes, even though he was quite strict, he was still like the grandfather of an ordinary family, doting on his grandkids and taking time to play with them. How is his condition? Olivia asked Jeremy. I don't know the details, but I guess after he fainted recently, he never got up again. At first, he was fine when his maids came to his aid, he could still talk, but it was more laborious. Later, he sort of slipped unconscious. And now, Jeremy paused and said, I don't know what will happen to him after he wakes. Oh, Olivia nodded thoughtfully and walked to the bedside. Is your grandfather Anders' biological father? I don't know. Jeremy seemed to be quite opposed to this matter. Can someone do a test? Olivia asked. Hmm? Jeremy looked at Olivia. What are you suspecting? It seems that your grandfather thinks Anders is actually blood-related, and not simply a foster son. That's why he treats him so well. But if you were to give him a blood test and determine he isn't in fact related, maybe your grandpa will disown Anders when he wakes up. I suppose no one ever tested him because grandpa said he was adopted, but but I didn't realize Grandpa actually thought Anders could be his own real son. Well, it was a result of an affair, so he couldn't say anything. At least that's what Veronica, Anders' mom, told him. She said she was impregnated by him. Olivia didn't have the heart to tell Jeremy that Veronica had also had an affair with Jeremy's father, so she left her explanation at that. How do you know all this? Jeremy asked, brow furrowing. Um... Olivia looked around nervously for a moment. I told her, someone said, suddenly entering. Olivia turned to find Chris entering with Sven in tow. I found out by tapping Veronica's phones when I was keeping tabs. You keep tabs? Not the point. Chris passed over Jeremy's concern. Though you would too if you had a bunch of powerful families allied against your business pursuits in America. Anyway, Olivia, you're too slow. I already made arrangements to get a blood sample from Anders Jarbaldi to find out if he's related to the Jarbaldis after all. The results will be out by tomorrow afternoon at the latest. So maybe this is why Chris had come here after all, Olivia nodded. Impressive, she said. Jeremy? Chris took out a stack of papers and handed it to Jeremy. I asked someone to keep an eye on your grandpa, too, before I got here. It seems his medicine has been changed. What? Jeremy was shocked. His grandpa was part owner of this hospital. Who would dare to harm him under the Jarbaldi's watch? Did they want to die? Jeremy took the papers and looked at them carefully. Because he took his mother to appointments so often for her eyes, he had some knowledge of medicine and medical procedures. 
After flipping through a few pages, Jeremy's eyes were fixed on the medication on the fourth page. This? Hmm? Olivia saw Jeremy's expression and went forward to take a look. What medication is this? She really did not recognize a bunch of medical terms. This seems sort of normal. On its own, sure. It's just that adding it to your grandpa's other medicines will cause a bad reaction, Chris said. What kind of bad reaction? Olivia pointed to Jeremy's grandpa who was lying on the bed and asked, Is that why he's in a coma? No. Jeremy shook his head. It will produce an excessive amount of acidity that is completely beyond the human body's tolerance. Long-term ingestion will lead to the dissolution of muscles. And also kidney failure, Chris said. I have checked your grandpa's medical history. Before Jeremy could ask how, Chris said, It's important to vet the heads of corporations you one day intend to buy from time to time. We aren't selling, Jeremy started to say, but Chris cut him off. There was originally diabetes in your grandpa's medical record. Even if he died from kidney failure in the end, a forensic doctor would only think he died of natural illness, and the reaction from those two medications would not be able to find out. So if the forensic doctor couldn't find it, how do you know? Olivia looked at Chris. Although she knew that Chris's power could not be underestimated, she was certainly impressed by this. He seemed to take delight in this as he thought, I pay people good money to know things I want to know, and I place them everywhere. Of course, I have my ways. Chris curled the corner of his mouth and said finally, It seemed like his cute little kitten, Olivia, was still unsure about him. The way she was baring her fangs and brandishing her claws was really cute. Huh. Olivia turned her head and ignored him. So someone is trying to hurt my grandpa and get away with it unseen? Jeremy asked. Suddenly, another man walked in from the outside in the hall and said, Can I trouble you to respect the patient? He wore black clothes and black pants. His hair reached his ears and he held a black suitcase in his hand. The smile at the corner of his mouth was very playful. I'm not sure how much conversation should take place around the patient. Brent, you are here. Good. Chris looked at the man and smiled. Fortunately, Brent happened to be in San Francisco, so he was called over directly. Do I dare not come? Brent curled the corner of his mouth. Move aside, I want to take a look at the patient. Okay. Chris responded and made his way for Sven and Brent. Jeremy narrowed his eyes. He didn't know this person, but he seemed to be someone Chris trusted. He didn't know what the situation was, so he had to step aside. Please move aside. Brent saw Olivia, who was still in front of the hospital bed. This girl was Chris's girl, right? What was the meaning of this look? Brent? Olivia stared at Brent. In her previous life, he was the one who pulled her back from the brink of death. At that time, she had given up on her will to live. It was Brent who had been talking to her and encouraging her in the operating room. His words were the only thing that supported Olivia to grit her teeth and endure the difficult surgery after she had been run over by Mark and Pamela. Are you willing to die? She remembered him asking back then how she could be willing. That's when she decided. Even if she wanted to die, she had to drag those two scumbags, Mark DeLillo and Pamela Cox, along with her. Even if she wanted to die, she wanted those two scumbags to fall into endless hell with her. Now she was reunited with her savior, and it felt surreal. Olivia? Chris was stunned for a moment. What was with that look in her eyes? She looked lost in thought. Little lady, you can rest assured about Brent's medical skills if that's what you're afraid of. Sven thought Olivia was worried clearly. I know. Olivia recovered her senses and nodded her head. She took a step to the side and said, Sorry to trouble you. It's fine. Brent took a look at Olivia again and then went to the bedside to take a look at the patient. They took out a pair of white gloves from the suitcase and put them on. They opened Jeremy's grandpa's eyelids to take a look. Then they glanced at the electrocardiogram next to them and picked up the medical record that the doctor had recorded and left. How is it? Jeremy asked after he saw that Brent had finished checking. How is he? I don't know yet. 
Brent reached out and pulled the infusion needle from the back of the Garibaldi Patriarch's hand. Huh. Interesting. Looks like as long as we stop the infusion of the BCT-0731, he'll wake up. There's been some damage, though. It could take about a week. A full week? That long? Chris frowned. Is there any faster way, something that could help him wake up in two or three days or today? Yes, of course. Brent smiled and said, but it could shorten his lifespan. He might live about five or six years less. Chris looked at Jeremy. The man in the hospital bed was Jeremy's grandfather after all. He would have to make the final decision. Go ahead. Jeremy frowned. If not, his grandfather might not even have the chance to wake up and live at all. All right, Brent nodded. Since the family members present have agreed, I will begin. Jeremy wore a nervous expression on his face and then nodded. Sven, shut the door and lock it. Don't let anyone in, Brent said. This process cannot be interrupted. Okay, Sven responded. Brent lowered his head and took out various kinds of medicine from his black suitcase to start making the appropriate solution. Then he directly inserted them into a small needle. Come, turn the old man over so his back is facing me. Okay, Jeremy and Chris nodded. They carefully turned Jeremy's grandpa over and let him lie face down on the bed. Open his shirt, Brent said. It needs to be a spinal injection. Jeremy and Chris did as they were told. Jeremy lifted up his shirt and exposed his grandpa's entire back. When he lifted up his shirt, Jeremy's eyes turned red. Originally, his grandfather was very strong. The people of his family cared about being in shape from the time they could walk. But now, seeing his grandpa, he felt that he had lost some weight and his face had caved in. When he lifted up his clothes, he realized that the old man was pitifully skinny. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that he was so skinny that he looked like a bag of bones. Hold down his four limbs, Brent said. The effect of this medicine might be a little fierce for the old man. Olivia heard this and went forward to bend down and hold the man's left arm with both hands. Chris pressed down on his legs, and Jeremy pressed down on his grandfather's right arm. Okay, here we go, Brent said with a strange smile. You guys ready? It's starting. After saying that, Brent used the white gloves to find the position and simply sterilize it before injecting it into the wound. As soon as the needle was inserted, Jeremy's grandpa felt something. His fingers moved, and as the medicine was pushed into his veins, his four limbs began to tremble. Olivia and the other two immediately firmly restrained him. Jeremy's grandpa was, after all, a strong boxer in his youth. Even if he already looked like this, he still had some strength and the muscle memory to use it. Olivia clearly felt that holding him back was strenuous. I can't hold him anymore. I can't hold him much longer. Hold on, Brent said. We can't let him move. Okay. Olivia gritted her teeth and pressed on Jeremy's grandpa's left arm. When her eyes were wide open and she was about to lose control, Sven pressed down and smiled at Olivia. Thank you, she said in a low voice. If you want to thank me, thank Chris. Sven whispered into Olivia's ear. He's absolutely sincerely into you. Chris had brought in Brent, who had a busy schedule, all the way to look at the Jarbaldi family patriarch, just to get Olivia to come back with him to New York sooner rather than later. If that wasn't true love, then what was it? Olivia slightly lowered her head and did not say anything else. Phew. Brent let out a long breath and said, Done. The others also slowly let go of the old man's limbs. Slowly, quietly, Jeremy's grandpa began to tilt his head. He spat out a large amount of turbid substance. He'll wake up fully in about an hour, maybe less, maybe longer. Brent started to pack up. Chris, you owe me one? After this, he still had to do his own scheduled surgeries this morning. Even though he and Chris had known each other for so many years and he didn't want to come over, Chris actually threatened him so he felt compelled to do this task. He would get Chris back though, eventually, he decided. 
I owe you big time. Chris agreed. I'll remember this, I promise. Chris wiped the sweat off his forehead and smiled. This old man was really strong. I've gotta go. I'll contact you if there's anything. Brent waved his hand. Wait a minute. Olivia hurriedly called out to Brent. You, um, you've worked hard. Really hard. She found herself saying, You're very talented. Okay. Thank you. Brent nodded and looked at Olivia in confusion. He didn't know this person before, so why was she looking at him like they knew each other? Why did it feel a little strange? That... Olivia's beautiful eyes turned and said, Why don't you stay and rest for a while? Jeremy's grandpa's condition can't possibly be very stable. If someone were up to something nefarious, he's still so fragile, they could probably take care of him. You know, and kill him or something. Yeah, well, that's your guys' problem, right? Brent smiled. It has nothing to do with me. I just do the medical work. Can you send me a private message on QQ? Olivia shrugged. I'd like to thank you for all your help. Chris frowned slightly. What did that mean? Why was this girl looking at him so strangely? Hmm? Brent looked at Chris and then looked at her again. Olivia looked at him and said, I have a proposition. As Olivia continued following Brent out of the hospital room, Sven put his arm on Chris's shoulder in confusion. Chris, why do I feel like you're agreeing with Envy right now? Chris's expression changed and he glared at him fiercely. Sven did not know how to shut up. Jeremy carefully picked up the things his grandpa spat out and cleaned up around his mouth and bed. His grandfather always liked to be clean, so he could not let him wake up and see this. From the corner of his eyes, he saw Olivia and Brent leaving. His heart was also uneasy. Olivia seemed to have a different opinion of Brent than she did of most people. She almost looked like she was in awe of him. Brent, I want to invite you out for a consultation. Olivia looked at Brent. For another patient. Oh? Brent understood what Olivia meant. He thought that Olivia had taken a liking to him and gave him a scare. No, I can't. I'll pay whatever you want. The price is up to you. Olivia said, I really need your help. She knew Brent's medical skills better than anyone else. I don't lack money. Brent spread out both hands and shrugged. Then what do you think will make you willing to do a consultation? Olivia frowned. What is your relationship with Chris? Brent looked at Olivia and asked. We're friends, though our parents think of us as an engaged couple. Olivia answered truthfully. She was sincerely asking for treatment. Brent sneered. Listen, if you promise not to actually marry that guy... I will go to this consultation you want me to do, Brent said. Chris was someone who always got his way and gave others a hard time, so Brent wanted to reciprocate and do the same to Chris if he could. The kid deserved it. All right, it's a deal. Olivia didn't even know if she intended to marry Chris. That was so many years away anyway. Don't agree so readily, Brent said. If you guys do get married, I will stop all of my treatment. If Jeremy's grandpa lives, I will send him to his death. If he fully recovers, I will cripple him, do you understand? All right. Olivia nodded and said, It's settled then. Okay. When Brent saw that Olivia agreed so readily, doubt arose in his mind. Could it be that this girl really had no interest in Chris? The corner of Olivia's mouth rose. With Brent around, Jeremy's mom, Celeste, would have a chance at regaining her eyesight this man had worked miracles before. Surely he could help Celeste too. As for her agreement with Brent, Olivia could always figure out how to get around that in the future if she needed to. She wasn't ready to rule out marrying Chris just yet. Who knew? Maybe they'd end up together. After all, she figured. When she returned to the ward, Olivia looked at Chris, Sven, and Jeremy and frowned slightly. She had to ask them sooner or later no matter what. How is Jeremy's grandpa? Olivia asked Jeremy. He's not awake yet, Jeremy replied. Brent stretched and said, The side effects of this medicine are very powerful in some people. If it continues until tomorrow, even if he wakes up, he will still feel so uncomfortable that all he will want to do is die. Fair warning. Uh, seriously? 
Why wouldn't you say such an important thing before we did it? Jeremy asked. I thought you wanted him to live. Brent said, I tried to explain it would have side effects. Do you have anything else you need to tell us or not? Chris gently touched his forehead and asked Brent impatiently. While a great doctor, Brent had a terrible bedside manner. But that's not exactly why people went to him. Anything else? Brent thought for a while and said, Yeah, don't turn him over within the first 24 hours. Just let him lie on his stomach like this. Otherwise, after using the medicine on his spine, the pressure will cause his blood flow to become disordered and he will die. Even if he is alive, he will not be able to do anything about saving himself. This was an extremely important detail. Why didn't he say it before? Jeremy wondered. If he had turned his grandpa over just now without realizing it while trying to clean him up, the consequences would have been unimaginable. Is there anything else? The corner of Olivia's mouth twitched. In her previous life, she was saved by such a strange person who seemed to withhold information for fun. Nope, I think that's it, Brett responded. You said my grandpa could lose five or six years of his life after doing this, Jeremy felt it was necessary to ask this. Can you tell me how long my grandpa can live, though? Even without those final five years, maybe? His body was seriously damaged by whoever switched up his medication. Even if he wakes up naturally and takes good care of himself, I'd say maybe... Maybe had he been healthy, he had a good ten years. Now, after this, maybe he's got one or two years? Still, it's better than being a vegetable. Brent stroked his chin and said, Everyone was stunned. Why didn't you say something so important earlier? Chris asked. You didn't ask. Brent spread out his hands with an innocent look on his face. Jeremy was also stunned. He looked at his grandpa again. Anyways, didn't you want me to do a consultation for another patient? Brent looked at Olivia and said, Let's go. My time is very precious. Olivia decided then and there that if Brent agreed to treat Celeste, Liv would have to ask him every question about potential side effects and downsides before letting Celeste agree to an eye surgery that could cause more harm than good. Okay, she said, right this way. Brent nodded and followed her with his black suitcase. Before leaving the hospital room, Olivia looked back at Jeremy and said, Jeremy, take good care of your grandpa. Okay, Jeremy nodded. He really had no way to leave at this time. He had to make sure his grandpa was okay. As soon as Olivia and Brent left, Chris wanted to follow them. Thank you, Jeremy looked at Chris, for figuring out someone was basically poisoning my grandpa and for helping him. Or, well, yeah. No need to thank me, I did it for Olivia. After saying that, Chris strode out. Sven shrugged at Jeremy. Protect her? Jeremy whispered to Sven. Don't worry, Sven nodded. He would definitely keep an eye on her with Chris. Besides, more of Chris's men would be here in a day or two. Jeremy looked at the empty VIP room and then looked at his grandpa, who was lying on the bed. He took a deep breath. It was time to end the ongoing infighting within the Jarbaldi family. Downstairs, Olivia and Brent were walking down the street, followed by Chris and Sven. The more they followed, the more Chris felt uncomfortable in his heart. The little lady seems to be in a good mood. She's talking and laughing, Sven said. Hmm. Chris coldly snorted and asked, Sven, tell me the truth. Hmm? Sven looked at Chris. What's going on? Is there a crisis? Sven wondered. Does he want to ask who is more compatible with the little lady? Then he would definitely say Chris. About what, Chris? Between me and Brent, who is more handsome? Chris had a serious expression on his face. Sven did not know how to react. What? He had to stifle a laugh because he couldn't believe how silly Chris was being. Hurry up and answer. Chris looked at Sven with a focused gaze. You are more handsome. Sven always felt that this question was very difficult to answer. Huh. Chris snorted. He was confident in his appearance, but he couldn't compete with the young doctor. And why was Olivia just confidently walking off with that guy? Chris brought Brent here, for God's sake. Was Liv just trying to make him jealous? From the first time Olivia saw Brent, her expression was something he had never seen before. How could it not make him angry? 
Regardless, this matter should be resolved as soon as possible, he figured. He had to take Olivia away from San Francisco as soon as possible. If he could help it, he would never let her see Brent again. Olivia naturally did not know what Chris was thinking because she was busy talking to Brent up ahead. Brent, however, could tell that Chris was angry. He deserved it. Who asked Chris to threaten him? He had been so close to him for so many years. How could he have the guts to threaten him now? Olivia brought Brent back to the Garibaldi estate and introduced him to Celeste. The first time Brent saw Celeste, he was shocked. He had practiced medicine for so many years, and he had seen all kinds of people. In his eyes, people were just bones mixed with flesh and blood. After death, their cells died and they simply went into the dirt. There was nothing special about the whole affair. It was pure science. But this woman was different. Her tranquil and indifferent appearance made people unable to tell there was something wrong with her until they got close. So, can my friend's mom's eyes be cured? Olivia asked. Oh, Brent finally recovered. Let me check them more closely. Okay, Olivia said. Sorry to bother you. Celeste nodded and smiled. She had given up a long time ago on trying to get better, but this was the child's intention. No bother at all. Brent took out a pair of brand new gloves from the box and gently examined Celeste's eyes, asking her how her eyes felt recently. Celeste answered all of Brent's questions one by one, with a smile of relief on her face. Close your eyes, I'll press on your eyeballs. If it hurts, you have to tell me, Brent said. Okay. Celeste closed her eyes. Brent placed his palm on the front of her right eye. Does it hurt? It doesn't, Celeste replied. Brent exerted a little bit more force. Does this hurt? A little. Celeste frowned slightly. Open your eyes. Brent moved his hand away and said, All right. Celeste opened her eyes and Brent moved closer to Celeste's face. Look up. At this moment, a wave of curses came from outside the door. Seriously, Celeste? How dare you do such a despicable thing before the patriarch of our family is even deceased? Olivia frowned and looked outside the door. She saw Anders' mother standing outside the door, looking like she was about to murder someone. I should have called everyone to see you. Veronica, don't speak nonsense. Celeste frowned at Anders' mother's curse. She was wholeheartedly devoted to her husband and didn't like the insinuation that she was somehow hurting his memory by entertaining another man on her deceased husband's family property. Hm. How dare you pretend to be good? Your father-in-law isn't even dead yet, and your husband can't be here to stop you. You... You really don't deserve to be the daughter-in-law of the Jarbaldi family. Veronica pointed at Celeste and scolded. You don't deserve to be here at all, and yet you've wormed your way in. Olivia said coldly. After Olivia's retort, Veronica choked and said, don't be unreasonable. Brent, how are Celeste's eyes? Olivia looked at Brent and asked, ignoring Veronica. She could not be bothered with her anymore with this wretched woman. If it weren't for Celeste, she would have turned around and used her powers on Veronica right then and there. It's not impossible to cure it, but it's a little difficult, Brent said, looking at Celeste. I don't have everything I need right now. Let's do it in two months. I'll make some preparations. We can start the operation in eight weeks. You have my word. What kind of surgery is it? Olivia felt that it was necessary to ask first. What will this operation entail? It's very simple, Brent said. There are two ways to do it. One is to perform a craniotomy and remove the blood clots in this position. I personally recommend this because the incision is easier to hide. Brent stretched out his finger and gently cut Olivia's hairline. Hair can hide it here and here. Olivia felt her scalp go numb. What about the other way to do it? The other type is to directly use a tool to cut into the eye socket. This will possibly leave a scar, but this way everything can be removed without leaving any traces or damage to nerve endings. Brent introduced. The specifics will depend on you guys. Anyway, no matter which one you choose to do, there is a certain risk involved. How confident are you? Olivia asked seriously. 90%. Brent spread out his hands and said, 
No surgery can be 100% risk-free. A person can die even if they're pulling out your teeth. Simple procedures carry some inherent risk, too. Olivia looked at Celeste's face and then looked at Brent and said, All right, thank you for your consultation. We will talk about everything in more depth later, after she and I chat. Okay. Brent looked at Veronica, who was still standing at the door listening, and said, Ma'am, I suggest you leave us right now, as you're violating doctor-patient privilege. You! Who are you trying to scare? Veronica was stunned when she heard that. Who knew if this man was really a doctor on a visit here? He could have been one of Celeste's lovers for all she knew. She had long disliked Celeste, so she wouldn't put it past her. Celeste clearly came from an ordinary family. In terms of rank, Veronica was better. At least her family still had a small company. Wasn't it better than the poor education and mid-management jobs at Celeste's family? Why was she, Celeste, the eldest daughter-in-law of the Garibaldis? It wasn't fair. On what basis should she be allowed to live here even after her husband had died? Although she did not want to mention the fact that she had had an affair with Jeremy's grandpa, Veronica knew that if she were to look at the actual hierarchy, Celeste would have to respectfully address her Veronica potentially as a superior. Her son, Anders, was either Jeremy's older half-brother or the son of the patriarch of the Garibaldi family himself. In the future, he would also be the person in charge. Her status naturally rose as well. Ma'am, I'm going to count to three. One. Brent picked up his suitcase. If you don't leave, I'm going to assume you have bad ears, in which case I could probably help you with that. What? Veronica asked, confused. Was this guy threatening her? She mustered up her courage and puffed out her chest, so she looked fearless. Two. Brent walked towards the door. She saw that the man was actually walking towards her, and Veronica was a little afraid. Even if he really could not do anything to her, if they fought, how could she compare to a man? Three. A hint of ruthlessness appeared in Brent's eyes. Huh. Just you wait. Veronica began to tremble, and turned around to leave in spite of herself. Brent, undeterred, continued out the door. When he was only a few inches behind Veronica, he subtly raised his hand and used a thin needle to pick a tiny spot on the back of Veronica's shoulder. It only took a moment, and he retracted his hand before she even felt the prick and turned around. Ouch, Veronica said, pausing to slap her shoulder. She thought she had been bitten by a small little bug. Then she realized Brent was closer to her than she expected before she cursed him and the bugs in the garden before striding back to her own villa. Hmm. Brent coldly snorted and then said to Olivia, who watched everything, I'm leaving. Take care, Olivia nodded. Brent looked back at Celeste again, then turned around and waved goodbye. After seeing Brent leave, Olivia squatted down in front of Celeste's wheelchair. Mrs. Jarbaldi, your eyes will be fine. I have seen Brent work and I think you are in really good hands medically. I'm fine either way. Celeste smiled and shook her head. Some people live for decades, and what they care about is how long they live, not whether they have truly lived or not. True. Olivia nodded and smiled. What about you, ma'am? Do you feel like you've lived? Me? Celeste smiled and looked at Olivia's blurry face. The fact that I married Jeremy's father and had a happy life with him before he was taken from us is proof that I have lived. She did not have any ambition or noble dreams. Her lifelong pursuit was to marry a man who loved her and whom she loved. Having a pair of children, she would clean and cook for her family, waiting for her husband to get off work, waiting for her children to come home from school. That was the joy of her life. She felt lucky she had already been able to experience it. Perhaps some people thought that a woman whose life revolved around her children and her husband every day was sad, but she didn't think so. No, what was lamentable wasn't who she spent her life living around. What was lamentable was that she felt restricted here now, and her soul felt stifled, yet she had a restless heart. Reading Celeste's thoughts, Olivia stopped and said, How did you two know each other, you and your husband? Olivia was a little curious. Olivia's own parents, Victoria and Michael, were of equal social status when they met. But what about Celeste and Jeremy's father? 
We were college classmates. When Celeste mentioned her deceased husband, there was a smile in her eyes. At that time, I did not think anything at first. In fact, I hardly thought of him like that. And then suddenly, one day he just ran over and told me that he liked me. I was shocked. Did you believe him? Olivia asked curiously. Of course I didn't believe him. Celeste smiled and said, I even suspected that he had other intentions. Hmm, why do you say so? Olivia asked. Because we knew each other before he confessed his feelings. Celeste lowered her head shyly. It's just that the reason why we knew each other made it a little hard to tell. Why? Tell me about it. Olivia looked at Celeste with sparkling eyes. I knew him because of a joke, Celeste confessed. At that time, we were in an improv group. I was pulled into the group because my roommate was in it and they needed more women. In the end, we needed to have a bunch of men and women pair off for a scene. Jeremy's father and I just happened to be a pair. At that time, we just treated the fact that we were a pair and a couple as a joke, so I really didn't think he was being serious. Celeste said with a faint smile. I see. Olivia nodded thoughtfully. So it made sense that she did not believe him. Yep. Celeste nodded and said, Anyway, my relationship with him back then was that he chased me around and I turned him down. I thought that he was just a frivolous young bachelor from a prestigious family. So I thought he was someone to play with, not to take seriously. Then how did you come to believe it was the right relationship later on? Olivia asked. Because of a stage accident during a school performance, it was somewhat sloppy when it was built. Later on, when I made a mistake backstage, the entire beam fell down. He saved me. Celeste recalled and said, It was really dangerous. I sprained my leg and fainted. He even held me tightly in his arms when I was unconscious. Ah, a hero saving a damsel in distress. Olivia smiled. This was a common scene in all kinds of dramas. There is no such thing as a hero saving a beauty. Celeste smiled and shook her head. At that time, the medical staff was exhausted from trying to separate the two of us. He grabbed me so tightly my arm was bruised. Ha <laughs> ha Olivia laughed. But I knew it at that moment. Celeste continued as she recalled how she met her husband. Her eyes were serious and focused. A man who would sacrifice his own life for me and even still protect me after something happened as a man worthy of me entrusting my life to him. Yes, definitely, Olivia agreed. She looked at Celeste and nodded slightly. Olivia? Celeste held Olivia's hand and asked, how is your fiancé? Hmm? Olivia was stunned. Why did she suddenly mention her fiancé? Your fiancé? Celeste nodded and said, He came all the way to San Francisco for you. That's enough to show that he cares about you. Yeah, it's, uh, complicated. Olivia shook her head and laughed at herself. Who knows how he really feels, or if it's real or not. Hmm? Celeste heard this and immediately laughed out loud. What's wrong? Olivia asked curiously. Your tone is exactly the same as mine was back when I was young. Celeste said with a smile. Olivia was stunned for a moment. Was it the same? Yes. Celeste smiled and said, If you really don't like your fiancé, you could also just pay more attention to the people around you. For example, she thought, her son. Of course, she couldn't say that. Otherwise, it would be like an old lady trying to force her own child on a poor, unsuspecting girl. True, Olivia nodded and said, she was too preoccupied thinking about Chris to hear Celeste's thoughts about Jeremy. Anyway, let's not talk about Chris anymore. Celeste, what do you want to eat for lunch? It is almost time. If you're offering to cook, I'll take anything. I love what you make. Celeste smiled and said, Is my son back? I don't know. I'll call him to ask if he wants to eat with us or if he's not. Olivia said, Okay. Celeste nodded. Olivia waved Sally, the housekeeper, over from the other side of the room. After handing Celeste over to her, Olivia turned around and went to the kitchen. After calling Jeremy and ensuring that Jeremy's grandpa had woken up, 
She found out Jeremy wasn't coming back for lunch. All right, you take care of him there, Olivia said. Thanks, Jeremy said. She could tell he had his hands full, or at least the entire experience of saving his grandpa had been emotionally taxing. With that, Olivia hung up the phone. Rolling up her sleeves, Olivia then began preparing lunch. Do you want to make enough for Chris and Sven? She asked herself, muttering under her breath. They followed her back to the estate, but after they arrived, they trailed behind as Olivia brought Brent directly to Jeremy's mom's villa. She wasn't exactly sure where Chris was now. Seriously, girl, did he come all the way just for you? Olivia whispered to herself as she curled her lips. When she thought of Celeste's words, Olivia's hand paused for a moment. No matter what, Chris had indeed come to San Francisco all the way from New York City for her. As she thought of this, Olivia sighed and added two more servings of food. What an annoying guy. Olivia shook her head and muttered to herself, and he and Sven are really good at eating. I'll clearly need to prepare two more dishes. Ugh. Olivia got to work, trying to push all her thoughts of Chris from her mind. First, she made a vibrant salad, featuring a medley of crisp garden fresh greens tossed with jewel-like cherry tomatoes, cucumber ribbons, and thinly sliced red onions. The dressing was a zesty vinaigrette, which added a tangy kick to the ensemble. Then she made a bowl of creamy tomato basil soup, its velvety texture inviting a comforting embrace. The rich, savory flavors promised a comforting contrast to the bright and zesty salad. Finally, she made the main course a culinary masterpiece, a succulent grilled salmon filet, perfectly seasoned and glistening with a delicate lemon butter glaze. They were accompanied by a bed of fluffy, herb-infused quinoa and a medley of lightly steamed asparagus spears and roasted baby carrots, all drizzled with a touch of olive oil. When Olivia finished cooking, and she was just about to set the finished dishes at the table, she heard Chris and Sven enter Jeremy's villa. It smells so good, I'm so hungry. Sven smelled the fragrance in the air and said, This must be the craftsmanship of the little lady. Wow, you have the nose of a dog if it led you here. Olivia smiled and said, Quickly wash your hands and eat. What good luck. I just happened to come back and I have food to eat. Sven smiled. Chris didn't say anything. After cleaning his hands, he sat down at the dining table. This place was strange. The Jarbaldi family had so much infighting going on, and even Anders had the support of perhaps other forces behind him too. It seemed like there were people from the seven major families who were determined to stir up the chaos. Olivia picked up a portion of salad and placed it on Chris's plate. Why are you in a daze? It's time to eat. Make sure to get your veggies too. Funny. Chris recovered his senses and looked at the food Olivia gave him with a happy expression on his face. Celeste, try the salmon. Olivia picked another piece of salmon and put it on Celeste's plate. She turned her head and saw Chris watching her, and Olivia rolled her eyes. She would eventually have to figure out what to do about him. Okay. Celeste picked up the plate and used her fork to empty her plate. Olivia felt sad when she saw Celeste like this, hovering so close to her plate to her face so she could actually see the food. Olivia felt so bad she got up and picked up a fork. Celeste, can I spoil you and feed you? Sure. Celeste knew Olivia was considerate, so she smiled and did not say anything. Her eyes were indeed becoming more and more disappointing, so she could use the help when it came to eating. Sven and Chris looked at each other. When they came this morning, they felt that something was wrong with Celeste. Then Celeste told Chris to come closer so she could get a good look at him. It seemed like Celeste had some problems with her eyes that weren't immediately obvious. Is it delicious? Olivia fed the salmon to Celeste and asked. It's very delicious. Celeste smiled faintly. Ugh, I wish Jeremy would seize this opportunity and get closer to live, Celeste thought. They were still eating when a group of people came from the other side of the compound, led by Anders' mom, Veronica. The sound of marching, stomping shoes could be heard from yards away. Veronica was crying so hard that she could not catch her breath. The makeup on her face was already streaking down her face. 
She was cursing and scolding, and no one knew what she was saying. What is going on? Hearing the noise outside, Olivia paused for a moment and put down her fork and knife. When she saw Veronica, Olivia frowned and asked, Why is she back? Is she looking for trouble again? Have Veronica and her friends not had enough the first time? What do you want? Olivia said, opening the door. After she asked that, Veronica and her group became much quieter, and even Veronica could only choke. You... you guys are going too far, you're bullies. Who is bullying who? Olivia felt this was funny. You have come to cause trouble again and again to not let my friend's mother just live in peace. Do you still have the guts to say that we are bullying you? Seriously, why did you come here this time? You know why. Veronica's gaze swept across the room. Where is that strange person? The one who threatened me earlier. Earlier, Brent had given her to the count of three and made some weird comment about whether she could hear him, and she thought at the time he was just talking nonsense. But then, after she returned to her villa, her ears started getting weird. Her left ear really couldn't hear anything anymore. This really frightened her. Who are you talking about? Olivia asked, though when she read Veronica's thoughts, she knew what had happened. Brent really did what he said he would, and it made her deaf in one ear. You guys, you guys are going too far. Veronica's eyes were red with pain. Let me tell you, why don't you hand him over? Otherwise, I will not let this matter rest. But Veronica, who is this person you're talking about? Olivia smiled disdainfully. You haven't even told me who you're looking for. I don't know who you want me to hand over to you. Cut the crap, you know who I want you to hand over. Veronica did not know the name of the stupid joker and could only shout at Olivia. What a joke, Olivia said. How would I know who you're talking about? Are you asking me to hand over your son to his actual father? After saying this, Olivia said meaningfully, I think you know what I'm talking about, right? Olivia's words made Veronica choke. Although she could think about it when she had nothing to do, she could say it when she mocked herself. But when Olivia said it in front of so many people, Veronica's face alternated between green and pale, pale white. You cried and cried and brought so many people over, clamoring for me to hand over some person, but why should I? Olivia snorted coldly. Because somebody hurt my ears and they know exactly what they were doing. Veronica pointed at her ears and said, it is that little friend of yours that you brought. Where is he? <laughs> Olivia laughed exaggeratedly and then stopped smiling and looked at Veronica. Did you hear my graceful laughter? Could you not insult me? Veronica curled the corner of her mouth downwards and had a look of disdain. You know I cannot fully hear and yet you insult me. Is this old thing really deaf? Olivia pointed at Veronica and looked at Chris beside her. You bitch, Veronica yelled. She appeared so angry that she was about to explode. Even in the past, no one dared to say that to her. But this Olivia actually dared to say such things about her. Thinking of the powerful people and connections that backed Olivia, Veronica was so angry that she could only curse, though she couldn't do anything substantial. How did your parents teach you to talk to people? Veronica looked at Olivia like she was about to charge straight for her or kill her, or both. Olivia inhaled deeply, ready. Oh, ma'am, are you angry? Olivia curled her lips as she looked at Veronica. So you did hear me then. Well, that's good. At least you still have your hearing. I, I can't hear you with my left ear. Veronica pointed to her left ear and said, do you have a doctor's note confirming that? Olivia spread her hands and asked, What? Veronica was stunned for a moment. Did she need a doctor's note? She just could not hear anything. Wasn't that proof enough? Without any proof at all, you came to my door and cried. Someone made your ears deaf, you're claiming, and just running around blaming someone who's not even here? That doesn't seem very fair, does it? Olivia's face froze in a look of pity. Don't you think you Darabaldis went a little too far with this ruse? 
I... Originally, Veronica was a reasonable person. But now, with just a few words, she became unhinged. Veronica's face turned red and she could not speak. Veronica, do you think maybe... Is there a mistake? The young man beside Veronica Gerarbaldi asked. Yes, I think there is a mistake. Another person in Veronica's group echoed. They originally wanted to watch the spectacle as Veronica Gerarbaldi chewed out Celeste and her guest. It would be the best way they could get their revenge. They knew that Veronica was deliberately looking for trouble. They had already said so. But now that they thought about it, how could someone just make a person deaf in an instant? Maybe Veronica was making it up. Did she think this was a martial arts movie? Nobody can make someone deaf in an instant. Maybe this Veronica was really muddle-headed. She was sketchy and she gave birth to a son in a sketchy manner. Her son's father became the family patriarch in a sketchy manner. Her identity was also sketchy. I... Veronica was in a difficult position to say anything. She really could not hear anything from her left ear, and yet no one believed her. She frowned and bit her lower lip. Forget it, V, let's go. Someone pulled Veronica's hand, trying to get her to leave with them. Yes, let's go. The others in Veronica's group agreed. They were from the Jarbaldi family, after all. Now that they'd made such a scene, it was really too ugly. They felt ashamed and didn't want to risk making fools of themselves more. Okay. Veronica was unwilling to go, but she still nodded her head. At some point in the future, she decided she would ask Celeste to hand over her lover's head, or whoever that guy was who was here earlier. Let's go. Where to? Where are you going? Olivia crossed her arms and said, Say it, Veronica. She said, reading the woman's thoughts. Say it. What do you want to do? What? Veronica frowned. What is it you really want from me and Celeste and everyone else you have a problem with? Olivia raised the corner of her mouth. What do you mean? Veronica's expression changed. You obviously want to start something. Olivia said. When Veronica refused to respond, Olivia narrowed her eyes. Fine. You don't want to admit to what it is you're after? Then I'll say what I want. Ask your son to apologize to me and admit his mistake. What? Ask my son to apologize to you? Veronica did not know what they were talking about anymore. Her son was the future heir to the Jarbaldi family fortune and business empire. If she and he played their cards right, how could he apologize to such a person so casually? So you're not apologizing? Olivia smiled and nodded. It's fine if you don't apologize but then don't even think about leaving. Listen carefully, no one is allowed to leave. The others looked at each other. What was up with this little girl? I want to leave. I want to see which one of you can stop me. Veronica's temper flared. A mere teenager dared to speak to her like this. How impudent. Sven gestured to the gun he always carried on him and looked at Chris. Quietly, he mumbled. We should have them all leave quickly. I want to see if my shooting is accurate. Not hearing Sven's aside to Chris, Veronica said, If you don't let me leave, then someone go and call my son to come settle this. At that moment, a voice came from behind the crowd. I am here. Immediately after, Anders appeared in front of Olivia, his face angry. Liv looked at Anders, who was walking step by step towards the crowd. Olivia's mouth raised. She did not know how long Anders had been standing behind the crowd. He really could be quiet, apparently. Miss Johnson, please forgive my mother for offending you. These words were squeezed out from between his gritted teeth. She could tell it pained him to say this. No problem, Olivia said with a smile. If there is nothing else, we will take our leave now. I do not want to stay any longer, and I'm sure you would like to get back to your lunch. Sorry for interrupting. After Anders said this, he turned around and left. Veronica quickly chased after him. Wait, wait, son, I can't hear you in my left ear. Veronica ran after Anders and shouted, Wait for mom. Anders did not have the slightest intention of stopping. He kept walking back to his home as Veronica trailed him. Honey, your mom is talking to you. Stop and listen to me. Are you serious? What kind of joke is this? 
Anders was about to collapse. I beg you, if you want to find trouble, choose a smarter excuse. What? No, I, I'm telling the truth. Although her original intention when she went over to Celeste today was to pick a fight, after she talked to that weird guy at Celeste, she really could not hear anymore. Honey, I didn't lie to you. Then hurry to the hospital. Anders clenched his fists. Why was this kind of person his mother? Someone so difficult and annoying? Then you take me there, Veronica said fiercely. When I get the doctor's diagnosis, you will be sorry, and they will all be sorry. Your left ear really can't hear anything. Anders looked at Veronica. No, I'm telling the truth, I swear. Veronica sighed. She did not know what happened. It had happened in an instant. Then let's go. I will take you. Anders' eyes moved slightly. Maybe it wasn't the worst idea to go to the hospital. There were, after all, other people he wanted to see there, weren't there? It didn't take long for Anders to get from his family's compound to the hospital, but he didn't have much patience. He paced back and forth in the examination room as a doctor looked at his mother's ear. If another minute went by, he told himself, Anders would not stay any longer. How much longer is this going to take? Anders asked impatiently after about 40 minutes. The problem I'm seeing is tricky. It will take about a half an hour, the leading doctor replied. All right, I will come back later, Anders said. Okay, take care, Mr. Jarbaldi, the doctor said. Honey, come back early in case they finish early. Veronica, who was surrounded by the doctor, said to Anders, Yeah, whatever. Anders answered impatiently and strode out. He walked to the elevator and pressed the button to go down, then raised his wrist and looked at his watch. He hesitated for a moment and then pressed the button to go up. He figured he had already come all this way to the hospital. He might as well head up to the top floor to see if the old man was dead or not. Anders took the elevator to the top floor and walked to the door of the VIP ward. In the ward, Jeremy was wiping their grandpa's face and hands. Grandpa, how do you feel now? Jeremy's grandpa frowned and shook his head. Jeremy saw and felt uncomfortable. He was old. He was already so old, and he still had to suffer this kind of torture. Even if he was a stranger, Jeremy wouldn't be able to bear seeing someone in this kind of frail state, let alone his own grandfather. Someone in the Jarbaldi family had clearly taken the initiative to attack their patriarch to try to make a power move. Jeremy immediately understood. Grandpa, that doctor of Chris's said that you can't turn over yet. You have to lie there for 24 hours. Jeremy's grandpa had no choice but to give up trying to get comfortable after hearing this. It was really uncomfortable to lie down like this. After being hospitalized this time, he was very thin. When he lifted his clothes, you could see the ribs under his skin. Now that he was lying down like this, he felt a little stuffy and painful in his chest. At that moment, the bell on the door rang, and Jeremy's face froze. He immediately covered Jeremy's grandpa with a blanket, turned around and walked out. No matter what, he absolutely couldn't let anyone see his grandpa's appearance. When Anders walked to the hospital bedroom door, Anders happened to pass through the guest room of the VIP ward. The two of them stood in front of the bedroom door. Jeremy, why didn't you tell me you came to the hospital? Anders looked at Jeremy and felt a little uneasy. He didn't know if something fishy had happened to Jeremy. Why didn't you tell me? Jeremy stood by the doorframe with an indifferent expression. I had to bring my mom. It was an emergency. But you? How long have you been here? We are family after all. Anders and Jeremy pretended to be sincere. Don't, don't talk too soon. Jeremy shook his head. Your mom and dad don't even know who your dad is. I wouldn't go around claiming your family. Anders' face froze. Wow. Jeremy looked at him and said slowly, You know, I've been thinking lately about how you don't deserve to be a member of the Jarabaldi family. It's not up to you to decide whether I'm worthy or not. Anders was growing more and more angry. Don't think that you are much better than me. Aren't I, though? Jeremy's eyes were full of ridicule. Anders, do you really think you can win the recognition of everyone in the Jarabaldi family as our rightful heir and grandpa's successor? Don't you know who your followers are? They're all idiot relatives, the ones who contribute nothing and expect everything. 
Anders clenched his fist. Besides Great Uncle Jebediah, is there really another person of any importance who supports you? Jeremy questioned. Is there? Our grandpa relies on his own interests and ability to speak, Anders said. Not yours, and he likes me. Yes, Jeremy replied. Are you sure that your ability is powerful enough to hide your origin, though? Anders stared at Jeremy angrily. This damned Jeremy, what a bastard. Anders, since I can bring people back from the brink of death, it means that I want to take back everything that belongs to me. Jeremy said in a cold voice. Anders suppressed the anger in his veins and smiled slightly. Then I wish you good luck. After saying this, Anders turned around and left. There was no need for him to waste time talking nonsense with a person who was about to die. Jeremy wanted to take back everything he had. This was just a pipe dream. He would not be able to live long enough to see that happen. And he might not even be able to live past the day after tomorrow. Yes, Anders thought. Now you've sealed your fate, Jeremy. At that moment, he decided he would wipe Jeremy from this earth, the same way he had wiped Jeremy's father from the earth. Anders didn't believe in competition. He believed in all-out monopolies, by any means necessary. There was a loud bang, and Jeremy jumped. Anders had slammed the door when he left, leaving Jeremy alone with his grandpa. Jeremy turned around and walked back to his grandpa's side. Grandpa, are you thirsty? Yes, the old man whispered. After sending a single word, Jeremy's grandpa opened his eyes and looked at Jeremy. This grandson of his had always been indifferent and seemed to not care about anything. Yet today, he said that he wanted to take back everything that belonged to the Jarbaldi family. Jeremy's grandpa, Franklin Jarbaldi, felt that this domineering spirit perhaps meant that Jeremy would make a very suitable successor to him after all. However, Franklin's eyes moved slightly. Jeremy had told him everything after Franklin woke up, and Franklin was very worried about Olivia. Her grandfather, Jack Johnson, was not a simple figure to begin with. He was a force one did not want to cross. Plus, this girl had Andrew Park's blood in her veins from her mother's side, so he had to be careful. Humans die for money and for power all the time. Although he knew that the seven major families were in the wrong, he didn't regret doing what they had done to the Park family all those years ago. The business world was like a battlefield. Even if the Parks wanted to separate from the seven great families and become their own entity, it was extremely unlikely they could have done so easily. Andrew Park's personality was eccentric, and no one could guess what he was thinking. This kind of person was either a close friend or an enemy, but never a neutral party you could simply let be. The seven great families chose the latter and attacked him first. Jeremy's grandpa did not feel that there was anything wrong with it. In the business world, there were ruthless people who made money every day, and there were even people who went bankrupt every day. This was very normal. Years ago, it was the Park family. Perhaps one day it would be the Jarbaldi's turn. This was the reality. There was no such thing as eternal friendship, only eternal benefits. Olivia. Jeremy's grandpa muttered this name under his breath. He looked at Jeremy with a pained, conflicted expression. At the same time, elsewhere in San Francisco, Olivia was looking at a piece of paper Chris brought her. Chris, where did you get this? I naturally have my own ways. Chris raised the corner of his mouth and sat beside Olivia. He leaned against her. Is there anything you would like to know? Olivia glanced at Chris. I am still angry with you. You keep showing up unannounced and you keep saying things that confuse me. Please just give me some space sometimes. Chris was speechless. How could she be angry? He should be the one who should be angry. What's there to be angry about? He asked, confused. Chris, all cooperation must be built on mutual trust. Olivia said earnestly. You don't have to worry about whether you can trust me. You saved my life and helped me. I treat you as my best friend. No matter what, I will never be your enemy. If you need any help from me, 
I will do my best to help you. Is that true? Chris's eyes lit up and asked. Of course. Olivia nodded affirmatively. Shake on it. Chris raised his palm and said, All right. Olivia responded and stretched out her right hand to shake Chris's hand. Just don't make this situation more confusing than it needs to be. Let's just treat this what it is, an agreement. That's all, right? After they shook hands, Olivia wanted to pull her hand back but found that Chris's hand was holding her hand. The two of them locked their fingers together. Olivia was stunned for a moment and looked at him in confusion. Since you've already agreed to our oath, Chris said, shouldn't you fulfill your promise to me then? What do you want me to do? Olivia asked seriously. It seemed that Chris had really wanted to force the issue. Marry me one day? I need a bride. You promised to help me. The corner of Chris's mouth rose. Chris, I'm still underage. Please don't ask for such a silly request right now. Olivia was stunned for a moment and said, Silly? I don't think so. Chris shrugged and said, I think telling you how I feel about you and asking you how you feel about me is important if we're going to be married one day to check in occasionally. Olivia rolled her eyes and pulled her hand out of Chris's hand. Then make your way home by yourself. We have a long time before we ever need to worry about actually getting married. Those conversations can wait. Chris narrowed his eyes. Why did she always make him feel such, such mixed emotions? Olivia's gaze fell on the document Chris had brought her, but her heart was a complete mess. Her head, too. She had to admit that when her fingers were coiled with his, she was indeed a little moved, especially when Chris mentioned marriage. Olivia believed he was sincere for a moment when Chris mentioned it. Does Chris really like me? She thought. The look he gave her didn't seem to be a lie, and the thoughts in his head that she read weren't a lie, but still... She didn't believe it. Or maybe she just didn't want to. She had way too many other things to do, to accomplish right now in her life. She didn't need to be dealing with silly little teenage problems. Chris naturally did not know what was going on in Olivia's twisted heart or in her muddled mind. He only felt a little defeated. Did this girl not want to understand how he felt about him at all? Or was she deliberately ignoring him? This was the first time in Chris's life that he doubted his own charm. Usually, girls swooned at his very presence and did anything to get his attention. Olivia would barely give him the time of day sometimes. After she finally managed to focus her attention, Olivia looked again at the document in her hand. Anders really has some skills after all, doesn't he? Yes, Chris replied. If this plan is implemented... The Jarbaldi family's total profits from all their companies will at least double. Olivia frowned slightly. Is this really Anders' idea? Olivia could not believe it. In her impression, even if Anders was not an idiot, he did not appear to have such foresight and great vision or business acumen. Accurately speaking, his business plans will increase their profits by about 1.75 times. Chris pointed at the time in the document and said, the day after tomorrow, Anders will mention this plan in the Jarbaldi family shareholder meeting for their corporation. At that time, anyone with a brain in that meeting will recognize it as a genius. Then they'll surely name him a successor to Franklin Jarbaldi. After seeing his in, I'm afraid, Anders can easily do away with Jeremy in an instant after that. He could practically kill the guy and nobody in that family would say a thing. They're money obsessed all eyes on the bottom line. So they'd probably look away if Jeremy was never seen again, as long as they were lining their pockets and doing well. Chris, do you think there's anyone else behind Anders? Working with him, I mean? The more Olivia read, the more suspicious she became. I do, yeah, Chris nodded and said. There definitely seems to be a force behind him that is helping him. Who? Olivia frowned. The Jarbaldis were one of the strongest among the seven major families, so it took guts to go after them or try to divide them. I didn't find out who yet. Chris shook his head. Whoever it is, though, is very careful. Not a single trace of him or her was left behind. Ah, Olivia was a little shocked. 
there is something that you, Chris, cannot find? Huh. Chris laughed a little. What do you think I am? Hmm. Olivia thought for a while and teased. Well, I thought you had superpowers, but apparently you're a mere mortal like the rest of us. Chris narrowed his eyes slightly. Did he look like a superhero in little tights and a silly costume? I don't like spandex. You don't have the figure for it, Olivia said with a smile. Chris shook his head. Fine. He gave up. She won, and he lost. After Olivia smiled, she looked at the document again. Then she suddenly thought of something and said, Chris, do you know what day it is the day after tomorrow? The shareholder meeting for the Jarbaldis? Chris said. Didn't I just tell you now? Not only that. Olivia's face darkened. The day after tomorrow is the anniversary of Jeremy's father's death. Chris stood taking this in. Interesting, Olivia said with a serious look. It seems the day after tomorrow will not be peaceful after all. Seems that way, Chris nodded. Go and inform Jeremy about this. I'll go and make some preparations. Hey, Olivia nodded. Thank you for helping Jeremy. I'm sorry it puts you in a precarious situation. It's worth it if it's for you, Chris said with a smile on his face. It's better to say for us. Anytime we help one of our friends, we're helping ourselves in the long run, assuring that our power is secure in the future. Olivia's eyes glowed as she said this. They both knew that anyone who dared attack someone in the seven families could easily and naturally want to attack the Jones family as well, or Olivia and her mother's family. Their actions seemed to be helping Jeremy, but this was simply what happened in alliances. Everyone benefited and became stronger when everyone was secure. When did you get so smart and cunning? Chris sighed and said. Can I take this as a compliment from you? Olivia smiled and asked. As long as you are happy. Chris whispered, saying the words close to Olivia's ear. Olivia pursed her lips. This Chris was really something else. Chris looked down at Olivia's helpless expression and looked over Olivia's shoulder before he bent down into her again to raise her chin. I will say it again for the last time. Hmm? Olivia looked at Chris's focused and longing eyes and felt her heart pick up speed. What do you want to say? Olivia, I like you. I like you from the bottom of my heart. Chris said, if it was just a partnership, I would not be able to do this. After saying this, Chris gently kissed Olivia on her forehead and turned around to leave the guest room where Olivia was staying. Olivia looked in the direction where Chris left in a daze. She could still feel his soft lips on her forehead and that residual warmth. Her cheeks flushed red and Chris's words echoed in her ears. She blinked and the documents in her hands fell to the ground. Chris really likes me, Olivia muttered to herself as her eyes looked around her guest room in a panic. She looked out the window to try to calm down, and it took a second for her to regain her senses. It was easier not to think about emotions like this. Extending both hands to cover her face, Olivia took a deep breath and forcefully suppressed the throbbing in her head. Then she picked up the documents on the floor and flipped through them again. But she found that she could not read them anymore. It was simply impossible to concentrate now. Suddenly saying such words... Olivia slightly frowned, causing her to be unable to continue looking at anything. Her head was discombobulated now. She simply put down the documents and dialed Jeremy's number. Hello? What's wrong? You sound upset. When he received Olivia's call, Jeremy felt a touch of joy in his heart, but her voice sounded off. How is your grandpa? Olivia asked. Not bad, Jeremy replied. He's come to and he's able to talk. Anders is going to cause trouble on the day of your father's death. Let's talk about the details more when we meet up in person. I can come to the hospital now if it's easier. Okay, Jeremy nodded. Come by now, I'll be here. After hanging up the phone, Jeremy turned around and looked at his grandpa Franklin. Grandpa, my friend Olivia wants to come over for a while, is that alright? Franklin looked at Jeremy. 
He could not help frowning when he looked into his grandson's eyes. He had been young before. He knew what Jeremy's expression meant. This kid was in love. This kid had lost so much in his life, and now he was in love. Thinking this, Jeremy's grandpa felt even more uneasy. He was already worried when Jeremy said he was going back to work with Olivia. Now it was clear that Jeremy was completely in love with the girl, which made things difficult for him. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the hospital, Anders and his mother, Veronica, were sitting in an examination room opposite an ear, nose, and throat specialist. What did you say? Veronica looked at the doctor in disbelief. You said my ears are fine? Yes, the doctor nodded. We have carefully examined them. There is no problem with your ears, ma'am. That's impossible. Veronica shook her head and whined. I, I really can't hear anything in my left ear, really. That might be a temporary blockage caused by your stress these last few days. Sometimes stress can cause psychosomatic responses. Please don't worry, the doctor said with difficulty. It was really troublesome. There was clearly nothing wrong. But this woman had wasted more than an hour of his time. There were still so many patients waiting for him to treat. psycho she yelled. It's when your mind creates symptoms that aren't really there. Impossible! Veronica angrily interjected. Oh, come on, I really can't hear anything. There's something wrong with my left ear. Veronica looked at Anders blankly. Anders, goddammit, I really can't hear anything with my left ear. He doesn't believe me. Anders endured his anger with all his might and said, Mother, let's go. Anders, honey, what I am saying is true. Veronica looked at Anders. She wasn't lying, and yet her own son was treating her like she was. Let's go, Anders repeated. He felt like all his patience was going to be used up by Veronica in no time. He did not have the slightest bit of time or patience to waste on this kind of useless, frivolous attention-seeking. Veronica saw Anders' eyes and lowered her head slightly. Why would the doctor not find out what was wrong with her? Upset and confused, Veronica followed behind Anders slowly as he walked out of the examination. Anders, slow down! Wait for your mom! The high heels she was wearing today were not very comfortable and slowed her down considerably. The longer she tried to catch up, the more it felt impossible. Anders walked forward without looking back. His hands were tightly clenched into fists by his side. Why did the child not have the right to choose his parents? At that moment, he was surprised to find Olivia walking towards him as soon as he stepped out of the examination room door. The two of them bumped into each other at the hospital's front entrance. Miss Johnson, what are you doing here? Anders asked worriedly. Do I really need to report to you what I'm doing here? Olivia crossed her arms in front of her chest and looked past Anders to see Veronica behind him. She sneered and said, Oh, you really came to check her ears. What did the doctor say? Do you need me to pay for your treatment since she claimed I'm somehow responsible? Or was she just faking it after all? Anders was already angry because of this matter. When he heard Olivia say this, his expression naturally became even uglier. Anders, mommy's feet are in pain. Wait for mommy. Veronica frowned as she called out to her son. She fell over in her heels, and her ankle should have been sprained. Anders, don't you want to accompany mommy to take a look at her foot? Anders heard Veronica say this and almost lost control of his anger. After meeting Olivia's mocking gaze, Anders restrained his anger. Miss Johnson, if you don't mind, I have to look after my mother. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Olivia smiled and waved her hand. She saw Anders brush past her again as Veronica limped behind her. Veronica was still asking Anders to hang back and wait for her to take a look at her feet when the two of them walked out of the hospital one after the other. After the two of them left, Olivia shook her head and laughed slightly before heading to Jeremy's grandpa's ward. After knocking on the door and entering, Jeremy came out to welcome her. Liv! Jeremy looked at Olivia, his eyes full of joy. You are here. Yes, sir, Olivia nodded and said. 
I just saw Anders and his mother downstairs. Yeah, Jeremy nodded and said. Anders came just now and was chased out by me. That's good. I'm glad you showed him who's boss. Olivia nodded. Jeremy, listen. Things are a little, um, troublesome right now. Do you have any trusted confidence in your family? Hmm? Jeremy frowned slightly and asked, What's wrong? Olivia told Jeremy about Chris's findings and warned him. Anders might try to do something to you the day after tomorrow. He dares? Jeremy frowned. The day after tomorrow was the anniversary of his father's death. He would be visiting his father's grave. No matter how treacherous Anders was, he could not do anything to Jeremy's father's gravesite, could he? It seems like he really dares. Olivia spread her hands. Just now, she had deliberately provoked Anders in the hospital hallway and listened to Anders' thoughts. Indeed, he wanted to get rid of Jeremy by any means necessary. If Jeremy encountered an accident and died, he would be happy to make that happen. Chris has already gone to make arrangements to try and help us. It's best that you make sufficient preparations on your end too, though. To try and stay safe, who knows what Anders is really capable of. Right. Okay. Jeremy nodded with a solemn expression. It seemed that Anders had reached a new terrifying state of madness. Logically speaking, he should have gotten the support of all the shareholders of Jarabaldi's in order to make that plan. Or was he doing this alone? How is your grandpa doing now? Olivia asked. Better than before. Jeremy nodded. The medicine Brent gave him was really strong. He's still really weak. I can imagine. Olivia nodded. She knew that feeling. In her previous life, when she had been nursed back from the brink by Brent, she had thought of giving up treatment many times. But in order to get revenge, she gritted her teeth and got through it. Wait a second. Jeremy seemed to have a thought of something and said, Steve said his flight to San Francisco gets in tonight. Steve? Our friend Steve Shook? What is he doing here? Olivia was confused. Remember he said he wanted to come with? Well, he couldn't originally, but maybe he was worried or maybe he heard something. Jeremy frowned. He should be on his way to the airport in New York now, though. Maybe we should arrange to pick him up. Olivia sighed. Forget it. Let him take care of himself. We've got to focus on your family right now. If he wants to find us, he can reach out. Okay. Jeremy nodded. Yeah, maybe you're right. On the other side of the country, Steve was on his way to his private jet at Telboro Airport. He was thinking about Jeremy and about how Jeremy had helped him in the past. If Jeremy rose to power as head of the Jarbaldi family, he'd be a good ally for Steve to have. And I'm a good ally for Jeremy. I'm wise and dangerous, and I even rushed over to help my friend in a time of need. Who wouldn't want me as a friend? While praising himself in his heart, Steve looked out the window of his car as he headed towards the airport and fixed his gaze on the world outside. Steve looked at the person who had just passed by the car. Wendy? He thought. Was that her? Just as Steve was about to ask his driver to stop so he could open the door to chase after her, he heard the sound of the turn signal turning on and then the driver's voice. Sir, the traffic jams in the city are quite serious today. I think we will reach the airport just in time to make your flight. His fingertip lightly touched the door before it was withdrawn. Hmm. All right. I was probably just seeing things, Steve told himself. There's no way that could have been Wendy. How could there be such a coincidence that I'd see her? Wendy probably hated him to death anyway. Even if it was really her, what kind of conversation could they even have right now? He was on his way somewhere, and she probably wouldn't even give him the time of day. On the sidewalk by the side of the road, a girl said to the man beside her, Where did you say that art store is? It should be right up there, up ahead. The man said as he pointed in front of him. You'll see it as soon as we turn this corner. Okay, I'll run over and take a look to see if it's open. The girl ran forward. Hey! The man shouted, Wendy, slow down! The day had been cloudy since dawn, and even the air was heavy with humidity. It's going to rain, isn't it? Steve put his arms on the window and looked outside. Should we bring an umbrella? 
The maids will make sure we have a few. Jeremy looked into the mirror and tidied his clothes and tie. Oh, okay, good call. Steve responded. If Anders really made a move at the cemetery, what would you do? Kill him? Jeremy whispered. A cruel look flashed across Jeremy's eyes. That was the grave of his father and the family plot that belonged to all the Jarbaldis who had come before them. The deceased members of the Jarbaldi family had been sleeping here for generations. It wasn't just his father who was there. If Anders disturbed all of them, Jeremy would kill him without hesitation. You know what you need to do, right, Steve? Olivia asked. Steve curled his lips in dissatisfaction. Yep, I came all the way from New York to help you guys, but now I'm not allowed to go to the graveyard with you guys. Steve was not very satisfied with the thing Jeremy and Olivia had tasked him with today. Your task is of utmost importance, Jeremy assured him. Jeremy tidied his own tie and turned around to look at Steve. Whether or not we can rope Anders in the end will depend on you. Steve stared at Jeremy and sighed heavily. Jeremy, you have changed. What do you mean? Jeremy asked in surprise. You have been with Olivia for a long time now. It's not a coincidence, you kind of sound like her now. In all seriousness, like you're on some dangerous mission. Steve shook his head and said, You didn't talk to me like that when we first met. It took a lot of effort for you to practice talking like that, I'd guess. Olivia's eyes narrowed. Is that what I really sound like? Serious, like I'm on a dangerous mission? She shrugged. Maybe I am. But maybe I shouldn't let everyone know. Jeremy heard Steve's words and was stunned for a moment. Then he laughed involuntarily and said, Maybe I do sound like her more these days. He had to admit that Olivia had indeed brought out a different side of him. But was that so bad? When Olivia walked back to her room to finish doing her hair, Steve walked towards Jeremy in a gossipy manner and whispered, When are you going to confess? I don't know what you're talking about, Jeremy said, clearing his throat. Oh, come on, it's obvious you're into Liv, and who knows? Maybe she's into you, too. I saw some changes in her eyes when she looked at Chris the other day. What changes? Jeremy frowned. How would I know? Steve shrugged. I don't know how to read minds. You can solve the problem of the three of you by just telling her how you feel, though. Maybe it'll just be the two of you, then. Jeremy was silent for a moment before he said, I should head out. All righty, be that way. Steve waved his hand. Good luck and be safe. All right. After closing the door, Jeremy revealed a strained look in his eyes. How did Olivia feel about Chris? Raising his head, Jeremy eyed the end of the corridor as Olivia had just walked out of her guest room. She was wearing a black dress with her long hair hung down to her shoulders. The pair of jade bracelets on her slender wrist added a trace of solemnity and grace, however. Ready? Olivia was the first to greet Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy nodded. He struggled to make conversation with her or to think of what to say next. You woke up very early today, he muttered. It would be better to say that I didn't sleep much. Olivia smiled helplessly. She already knew that something big would happen today. Logically speaking, she would have laid down early last night so she could have a good sleep. In the end, she just kept tossing and turning finally accepting that she could not fall asleep at all. She only took a short nap at dawn. She was muddle-headed and could not tell whether she was sleepwalking or not. Are you not feeling well? Jeremy walked towards Olivia and asked. I'll be fine. Olivia shook her head. It would be more accurate to say that she felt uncomfortable and nervous. Whenever she closed her eyes, she would think of Chris, too, on top of everything. This was really annoying. This is exactly why I don't want some silly relationship in my life right now, she thought. It's so distracting. If you are feeling any discomfort or you're too scared to come today, you must tell me, Jeremy said. I want to keep you safe. I know, Olivia nodded. Let's go downstairs. Your mom must be waiting for us. She took the lead and walked down the stairs. Jeremy looked at Olivia's back and lowered his eyes slightly. After today's matter was settled and the traitors were eliminated, he must confess to Olivia his true feelings for her. He felt it so deeply he got tongue-tied just thinking about it, though. Walking down the stairs, Olivia saw Celeste in a long black dress sitting in her wheelchair. 
She looked out the window. Her expression was somewhat sorrowful. Celeste, good morning. Olivia went up to greet her with a gentle squeeze on the shoulder. Olivia, morning. Celeste turned around and looked in Olivia's direction. Although it was blurry and she could not see anything very well, she still revealed a quiet smile. Celeste, you woke up so early. Olivia walked to the front of Celeste's wheelchair and squatted down. Yes, Celeste smiled and nodded. You will sleep less when you are old. How old are you? My mom says she turns 28 years old every year, Olivia said. I'm sure it's the same for you, right? <laughs> Celeste laughed and shook her head helplessly. You know how to flatter an old lady. <laughs> Olivia smiled. Celeste let out a light sigh and reached out her hand to stroke Olivia's cheek. If Jeremy's father was still here, he would be happy that our son had such a lovely friend like you. Olivia opened her arms and gently hugged Celeste. She really felt sorry for the lonely, broken woman. I'm fine, dear. Celeste patted Olivia's back and said, Come, have some breakfast. We are leaving soon and we won't come back until afternoon. If you don't eat something now, you two could starve. She teased. Got it. Olivia lightly walked to the dining table to sit down. Just as Olivia sat down, Jeremy greeted Celeste and sat opposite Olivia. After the two of them sat down, Chris and Sven walked down the stairs from the guest room Celeste had arranged for them in the converted attic. Morning, Olivia said before she lowered her head and looked at the breakfast in front of her. She didn't want to look at Chris. She was still flustered by their exchange the other day. Morning. Chris greeted her and sat on Olivia's left side. Jeremy glanced at the two of them out of the corner of his eye. He had an instinctive uneasiness in his heart as he watched them. Something was definitely going on between the two of them. During breakfast, everyone was strangely quiet. After they finished their meal, though, they left the Garibaldi estate and went to the cemetery, which was located only a few miles east of the family compound. Back when they chose their plot at the cemetery, the family patriarch at the time had invited a famous architect to construct a mausoleum, and he consulted multiple priests before picking the location. Now, the black car carrying Olivia, Jeremy, and everyone else stopped at the entrance of the Jarbaldi mausoleum. Olivia gasped when she saw it. The mausoleum unfolded like a cathedral of remembrance, with vaulted walls that soared to impossible heights. Adorned with frescoes of celestial realms and cherubic figures, their gazes downcast and benevolent vigil. Rows of arched alcoves lined the walls, each one housing a sarcophagus of polished granite, bearing the names and likenesses of Jarbaldi forebears. In front of the mausoleum, a kentoff of alabaster and onyx stood as a focal point of reverence. Adorned with meticulous carvings, it captured the essence of the Jarbaldi lineage. A tableau of triumphs, losses, and the unyielding strength that bound them all. The air carried the scent of age and reverence, a tapestry of memories woven into every stone. Here, the past and present are intertwined. The mausoleum was a stunning sight to behold, but as soon as she got out of the car, Olivia heard a crow's cry overhead. The sound, combined with the gloomy weather, made her feel uncomfortable. The atmosphere was ominous, and Olivia looked around as the hair on her back of her neck stood up. Something's not right, she thought. Something's very, very wrong. She could sense it. That same power that let her read the thoughts of others seemed to be telling her something heavy and sinister was in the air, waiting around the corner. She felt a fear she had never felt before. But when she looked at Jeremy and his mother in her wheelchair, she knew she couldn't simply run and abandon them. She needed to be here to keep Celeste safe. As the group stepped in front of the mausoleum, Olivia felt a wave of pressure from all directions. She staggered and her face flushed red. The discomfort here was even greater than at the Jarbaldi estate. Grinding her teeth, Olivia frowned and looked around all the tombstones. Were all the here spirits trying to tell her she wasn't welcome? Did they somehow know she too had been a spirit, but she had been allowed to come back? It was as if for a moment she was being told she couldn't enter the mausoleum. So what if I am not welcome? She thought defiant. No one asked for your opinion. I came in anyway. What can you do? It's best if you all just lie down obediently and let me do as I please. 
Olivia, what's wrong? Jeremy noticed that something was off with Olivia and went forward to support her with his arm around her. Nothing, Olivia muttered distractedly. There's some, um, I don't know, there's a, just a weird vibe here. Was it all the dead spirits around here? Was this because she had once died herself? So being surrounded by the dead now was like being pulled back to the world she had once visited? Oh my god, she thought, her vision suddenly going black. I'm going to faint. What was happening? This was a mistake, she feared. I should have never come here. Olivia? Are you all right? Jeremy called out. He was confused by the look on her face. She seemed pale and she shot her hand out, as if she was trying to stop herself from falling forward. Uh, yeah, um, it's okay, I'm okay. Olivia shook her head and propped herself up against the walls of the mausoleum after entering, so she didn't fall forward. Her vision had gone black and she couldn't see, but she willed herself to calm down and breathe slowly. Finally, after a few moments, little pixelated dots of vision returned, and she could once again see. She looked around at the names of the deceased again. Jeremy stood back, concerned, and then helped her to follow his mother and the others further inside. Her head was very, very heavy now. Although the pressure seemed to have decreased a little, Olivia still felt very uncomfortable. She could not let anything go wrong at this moment. Keep your wits about you. She admonished herself. You're letting your mind play tricks on you. Chris was the last to enter the mausoleum and walked at the back of the group. He looked at Olivia, who was leaning against Jeremy now, and clenched his fist. What was the meaning of this? Was she trying to hurt him? Chris? Sven put his arm on Chris's shoulder and said, My condolences. Get lost. Chris glared at Sven and raised his foot to continue walking forward. Somebody's prickly. Sven shook his head and sighed as he followed. Jeremy stopped in front of one of the crypts in the mausoleum. He looked at the etched marble in front of it with a solemn expression. Olivia looked at the plaque on the marble and saw that it featured a middle-aged man. She recognized him as the same man she had seen earlier in an oil painting hanging in Jeremy's house. The man on the plaque smiled very happily and confidently. It seemed that he was full of confidence in his future life. His facial features were almost identical to Jeremy's. After laying some flowers down before the crypt, Jeremy looked at his mother, Celeste. He knew that his mother must be more upset than him. In all his memory, he had never seen his parents angry or even raise their voices at one another. The two of them had always been very loving towards each other, as if they were mere teenagers. Yet they were also very respectful to each other and treated one another with the maturity of adults. Jeremy, your father's resting place, how is it? Celeste asked before she could bring herself to take a look herself. It's pretty good, very clean, Jeremy replied. This burial site had always been guarded by someone, and every plot was always tidy. As long as it's clean, Celeste murmured. Your father likes to be clean and tidy. His clothes and tie have to be ironed several times. Only when this place is clean will he be able to sleep comfortably. Yes. Jeremy lowered his head slightly, tears welling up in his eyes. His mother always spoke in the present tense when discussing her late husband, and that always broke Jeremy's heart. She couldn't move on, and it was clear. Their family had never hurt anyone. His father had always worked hard. So why did he have to encounter such a tragic end? Why did his mom have to be so lonely, unable to move on? Why? Why did someone do this to them? Someone's coming, Chris said suddenly, very alert. Olivia, bring Celeste and the housekeeper outside. Okay? Olivia nodded and closed her eyes to listen to the thoughts of everyone around her. She could sense a large group approaching from outside the mausoleum so she took Celeste toward the back exit. There are a total of 12 people approaching. You guys be careful. Although they did not know how Olivia knew the number of people, Chris and Sven still nodded. Chris wanted to ask why Olivia guessed 12, but she was already walking away. Olivia felt even more dizzy and winded after using her abilities to try to read the thoughts of so many people who were so far away. 
so the hand she used to guide Celeste's wheelchair was trembling slightly. Miss Johnson, be careful, Celeste's housekeeper Sally said, holding the wheelchair with one hand and Olivia's arm with the other. I'm fine, Olivia gritted her teeth and held on. At a time like this, how could she hold anyone back simply because she was feeling off? She took heavy steps and walked step by step towards the route that they had planned the night before, based on the map of the cemetery. As Olivia and the other two left, Sven stretched out his hand and touched the wire attached to the wire in his ear. Team A, be sure to keep up. We must ensure the safety of our people. Roger that, a voice said over the wire. After the sound of the electric wave echoed in his ears, Sven moved his hand away from his ear and nodded at Chris. Then he gestured toward the front of the mausoleum at a group of people approaching. One, two, three, six, seven, ten, eleven, twelve. Sven started counting the number of people who suddenly surrounded them and said, It's really twelve people. How did Olivia guess so accurately? Cut the crap and pay attention. This is serious. Chris frowned and said, Got it. Sven nodded. Sven, Chris, Jeremy, and a handful of Jeremy's servants and security detail had accompanied them, along with a few of Chris's security detail prepared to fight off the approaching group. Not everyone was armed, but those who were were ready. Okay, Chris thought, come and get us. This is bound to be a fierce battle. On the other side of the cemetery, Olivia and the other two women quickly arrived at a well-hidden spot they had previously decided on with Chris and Sven. Along the way, they had been scared and had to stay hidden in the tree line. But Celeste finally breathed a sigh of relief when they got to the agreed-upon spot. Olivia was breathing heavily because her vision was still blurry and she felt faint. Miss Johnson, Sally cautioned while looking at Olivia with grave concern. You, um, you have a nosebleed. I'm fine. Olivia reached out her hand to rub her nose and sure enough, she found dark red blood smeared along her fingers when she retracted her hands. It's just the air outside, don't worry. Miss Johnson, I'm worried your condition is not very good, Sally said. One of Chris and Sven's men, who had agreed to guard the spot Olivia and Celeste had sought refuge in, watched Olivia's exchange with Sally and then reported the details of it to Sven over his earpiece. What? Sven replied, stunned. What happened to Olivia? Why is she bleeding? Was there an ambush over there? No, there was no problem with their safety, but Miss Johnson seems to be in a bit of a bad situation. She's experiencing a pretty bad nosebleed, and it looks like she's sick. This certainly isn't good, Sven frowned, unsure what to do about it. But before he could really react, a bullet flew towards him while he was in a trance. Sven, get down! Chris pushed Sven aside with one hand. Go over there and hide and be careful. Shit, sorry. Sven was so shocked he broke out in a cold sweat. He immediately ran from the mausoleum and ducked behind a tombstone to hide. After hesitating for a moment, he decided not to tell Chris about Olivia's nosebleed or her current state for the time being. There was much more pressing things to attend to. Damn it! Jeremy saw that his great-grandfather's tombstone had been pierced through by a bullet. Anders, he thought, that's unforgivable. But to desecrate our family's burial site, you won't get away with this. Now nobody will back you. Ah! Someone yelled. Jeremy looked over to see one of the men in his security detail had been shot in the knee and fell to the side of a headstone. He held his leg and grimaced in pain. Beside him was some sort of box, but Jeremy couldn't figure out where the box came from in the cemetery. The injured man looked at it and exclaimed, Jeremy! What? Jeremy carefully squatted down and turned his head to look at the injured man. There are explosives! The man called out. But before Jeremy could respond, the man was shot in the head. Ah! Jeremy cried out in shock. He frowned and immediately drew back in fear. Blood spurted from the man's wound, and Jeremy thought he would throw up. The air was thick with the smell of copper or rust, the smell of blood. Explosives! Jeremy yelled, confused. Sven and Chris looked at each other. Apparently, Anders was really ruthless. Had he actually wanted to blow up his own family's centuries-old gravesite, 
where all his forefathers were buried and with them their personal history? We need to hurry up, Sven said. Yeah, Chris nodded. They didn't know how powerful the blast might be or how many explosives were in the box before them. But if they failed to stop the explosion, they could all die soon. Team D, we need to move out of here, Sven yelled into his earpiece. Roger that. Back where Olivia stood with Celeste and Sally, she heard gunshots being fired over one of the security guards' walkie-talkies, and she froze. Her first thought, reflexively, was, Chris. She hated that it was her first thought, but she couldn't deny it. She cared about his safety and Jeremy's, and Sven's too, of course. I'll be right back, she muttered, determined. But miss, you have to stay here. One of the guards started to say, but Olivia cut him off. I said, I'll be right back. You're not well, Sally reasoned with her. Don't worry, I'm not going to where the guys are. I just dropped something along the way when we ran here and I'm going to get it. She lied. What was it? I could go get it, one of the guards said. But by the time he finished his sentence, Olivia had already taken off. I'll be back in a second, I promise. If I'm not back in five minutes, you can come find me. With that, she was gone disappearing into the tree line again. Olivia struggled to stay upright, but this time she felt sustained by a determination she hadn't felt before. And from deep within her, a tingling sensation bubbled up within her and carried her forward, so she felt like she was flying forward instead of running, with all the energy in the world, as if summoned from some unknown source beyond her. All Chris and his men knew was that they had retreated through the back exit of the mausoleum, and as they were tending to their injured men, they heard someone from the Anders group yell, What the? Within seconds, there was a great rumbling and a series of shouts, and then what sounded like a bag of liquid being cut open. What was that? Chris asked Sven. Not knowing, Sven waited a few minutes for Anders' men to appear and chase them, but when none did, he doubled back into the mausoleum. Oh my god, he said, returning pale and gagging. I think one of the explosive must have gone off. What? Chris asked. It didn't sound like an explosive. I know, and the mausoleum doesn't have any evidence of any burns, but... You don't understand, Chris, don't go in there. Something happened to those men. It's like something very powerful made them all... It's like there was a ball of energy or some sort of shockwave in there. It's like they exploded or imploded... I don't know what caused it. Upon saying this, Sven keeled over and threw up. Chris took this in and then looked around. Well, if they have weapons like that, we should get out of here. Come on. They could have buried more like that elsewhere, and we don't know if they have reinforcements. What should we do? Sven asked, still nauseous from what he had seen. It will be too late to get someone to dismantle any explosives we find now. What if they're on timers? You guys can leave. Jeremy squatted down next to the man who had been killed in a security detail. He reached out his hand to close the man's big blue eyes and said, I will go through and try to disassemble the rest of the explosives. It's my family after all. If anyone's going to die trying to disassemble the bomb and save our legacy, it should be me. He was a descendant of the Jarbaldi family. He couldn't allow anything to happen to his family's ancestral gravesite. Not to mention that his beloved father was buried here as well. But you have no idea how many explosives are even buried here, or how to disassemble them. Sven frowned. Come with us, don't be foolish. Take good care of Olivia. Jeremy glanced at Chris and stretched his hand toward the bomb that Chris's team had found. If he was lucky enough, he could dismantle all the bombs. If he was unlucky, well, he would be joining his father very soon. Chris frowned. Sorry, bud. Can't let you get yourself killed while trying to be heroic, he said. With that, he raised his hand and conked Jeremy on the head, knocking the poor teen out. Besides, I already know it's my responsibility to take care of Olivia. You don't need to tell me. He looked at Sven, who was giving him an incredulous glare. What? Was the knocking him unconscious part really necessary? Sven asked. Chris shrugged. He wanted to try to dismantle explosives. He's not thinking clearly. Chris bent down and then hoisted Jeremy's body off his shoulder. Besides, 
he said, heaving as he carried Jeremy. It was just a light tap. He'll come to in a few minutes. Just enough time for me to get him out of harm's way before he gets us all blown to smithereens, you know? Sven shook his head and then helped carry Jeremy. After a moment, he said quietly, It's good we're going to meet Olivia anyway. Our men said that she wasn't doing very well. Why didn't you say so earlier? Chris frowned and immediately took off faster, sprinting towards their gathering point. Sven sighed and then broke into a sprint behind his boss. Soon, all of Chris's men were trailing him. Then Jeremy's men looked at Chris, who was carrying his Jeremy. They too began following him. When they arrived at the meeting point, Olivia had already returned minutes earlier, feeling a mix of both reinvigorated and, paradoxically, more tired than ever. She had somehow found the energy to run into the mausoleum and summon all her power to emit a wave of energy so strong it reverberated in the small space and split open the twelve men who had surrounded her. All of Anders' men fell at her feet, and as soon as she entered the mausoleum, she began to retreat, back to her meeting spot. And while she recovered from her nosebleed, and soon as her adrenaline stopped pumping, Olivia felt like she might fall to the ground and slip into a coma. She had never felt so exhausted. Her limbs ached she was so burnt out, but she had to pretend all was normal so nobody would suspect a thing. What are you doing? Olivia looked at Chris carrying Jeremy's limp body. Jeremy, is he dead? What happened? No, don't worry, he'll be fine. Chris shook his head. Anders buried explosives around his family's grave. Jeremy wanted to stay behind to dismantle the bomb, but I knocked him out so he didn't hurt himself. Olivia nodded. Although most of the Jarbaldi elders had not welcomed her, it did not mean that she could accept such an outrageous thing as blowing up their family's mausoleum. Come on, we've got to get out of here. If Anders is willing to blow up his family's history, we have no idea what else he has planned for you guys, Sven said. I already asked someone to drive the cars around. Okay, Chris responded. As they got into the car, Celeste Garibaldi was still asking about Jeremy's condition. She had been sitting in her wheelchair out of earshot when Sven and Chris arrived with Jeremy moments earlier. Now, Olivia did not dare to tell Celeste about the explosives near the family mausoleum. She simply lied and said that Jeremy was sitting in the back of one of the cars and was fine while putting Celeste in another car. Only then did Celeste feel relieved. Sally, who was in the same car as Jeremy, looked at the unconscious teen in the back seat. She was conflicted. No matter what, his mother could not see him. If she did, her mind would race and she would go into shock. As soon as the cars drove out of the cemetery, they heard a deafening explosion. The bulletproof window was shaken out, creating spiderweb-like cracks, and this time, they saw a fireball shoot into the sky. Even the meeting place they were just now had turned into scorched earth. Olivia instantly broke out in a cold sweat. They had only very narrowly escaped. Chris frowned. His eyes were burning like torches. How could Anders Gerbaldi prepare so many explosives on his own? He had to have help. Who was the person working with him? If Chris Jones couldn't even find out who it was, the person must have been quite skilled. Olivia lowered her head, devastated. She turned her head to look at the calm Celeste, who she sat beside. Mrs. Tarbaldi. I'm fine. I'm fine. Celeste shook her head. Trust me, sweetheart, I'm accustomed to loss. I know how to weather it. She had already expected that something big would happen today. Although her eyes were not very good, her heart was clear. She felt she had a sixth sense about these things. She was more sensitive than other people to the tense atmosphere of the past few days. Olivia, will Jeremy live well? Will he be okay in life? Or is he destined to be targeted and hurt by corrupt, ambitious people like Anders? Celeste did not ask for too much. She only hoped that her children could live happy, successful lives. Yes, Olivia nodded affirmatively. Jeremy will be okay. He will live well, Miss Darbaldi. I promise you that. Thank you. Celeste nodded slightly. I only hope my husband's tomb still exists and wasn't destroyed. Olivia felt a little awkward and nodded. How much could one woman endure? She wondered, sympathetic. Celeste lowered her head and did not say anything else. 
After they escaped the explosion and she spoke to Celeste, Olivia immediately called Steve. The phone rang for a while before he picked up. Why did you take so long to answer the phone? She asked, almost accusatory. Whoa, you're mad at me? If anything, I should be mad at you. Steve's tone was full of helplessness. You only asked me to pick up the old man, but you didn't tell me there was a killer here. Five or six killers, actually. I'm only one guy, and you actually blame me for picking up the phone slowly? Where's the empathy live? Standing on the floor covered in blood, Steve's face was filled with anger. What? Oh my god, what happened? Steve shook his head exhausted. I'll uh, explain everything when we see each other in person. Right now, I'm securing a way out of here. I called one of Chris's guys to help me. I've got the old man, though. Good. Take Franklin and bring him to our meeting place. Olivia nodded. Thanks for the comforting words. Steve snarked before shaking his head. I'll see you guys soon. Steve said a few more words before hanging up the phone. He reached out his hand to wipe the blood from the corner of his mouth. Steve walked to Franklin Jarbaldi, who was sitting in a wheelchair, and asked, Sir, are you all right? Well, I'm not dead, Franklin said matter-of-factly, so there is that. He looked at Steve anxiously. Very good, keep it up. Steve patted Franklin on the shoulder and went behind the wheelchair to push Franklin out of his ward. Come on, we have to go. At that moment, a man who was shot and lying flat on the ground raised the gun in his hand shakily and aimed it in Steve's direction. His eyes were full of rage, and he decided if he was going to die, then Steve had to die with him. Franklin's eyes narrowed when he saw this. He picked up the fruit knight from the fruit plate on the table beside his hospital bed and threw it at the man's temple. The man died on the spot. Whoa. Steve was dumbfounded when he realized what had happened. He also understood why those people had tampered with Franklin's medicine. This old man was really a force to be reckoned with, apparently. Let's go. Franklin sat back in his wheelchair and frowned. He was the only one who was allowed to feel weak now. Steve needed to be alert and ready for anything. All right. Steve pushed Franklin down the hall and out of the ward. Anders is dead, Franklin thought. He actually dared to try and kill me? The patriarch of this family? What kind of madman is he? I'll never let him get away with it.